uh, we're really looking forward to seeing a lot more signatures on that wall. Now, after the signatures, the closeout leads there, the suit technicians, uh, are basically, right now, we can see them doing uh, a, a pre-ingress. You can see the next two um, are making their way down, down the crew access arm. Um, yeah, that closeout lead there is doing the, the pre-ingress checks, making sure that all the zippers are closed, um, making sure that the boot covers have been removed from their boots, uh, removing the protecting the protective cap that's on top of the umbilical port. Um, if it were raining, obviously it's a <laughs> it's a beautiful day in Florida. Yeah. Um, and if it were raining, this would also be the opportunity that we would wipe the boots down right. um, before anybody enters. They're also just reminding the crew to be extremely careful when when uh, ingressing. There is um, we want to make sure that you know. There's no contact between the side of the vehicle and their helmet, for example. Right. Um, so just making sure that everyone, and again, we've practiced this many times, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned, the crew has logged 700 to 1,000 hours. That involves practicing getting in, getting in and out of the yeah. capsule. <laughs> yeah, but like you said, this is a really controlled environment, right? This is really, when you button that hatch up, I, that is ready to go to ISS. And that controlled environment, you gotta take care of and make sure that you're, you know, it's a, it's a crowded room in there as we can see right behind uh, Larry and Aton as they're awaiting their ingress trance as well. Um, but it's busy in there. And we gotta make sure that, you know, you're watching out for things like hatch seals and um, making sure that all of their suit, their flight suits are well taken care of and well maintained as they get into the vehicle. But like you said, Kate, it's, it's a well rehearsed, well choreographed situation. So it looks like the closeout leads are performing that pre-ingress check. Now there's already a closeout lead or a suit technician inside the capsule. Um, they're ready to support the crew members as they make their way into their chairs. And first up for ingress will be Commander MLA, or Michael Lopez Alegria. You see Mark there getting a, uh, a pat on the back as well, saying, hey, man, congratulations. <laughs> Let's make this happen. So basically, they're, they get in their seats. Um, obviously, got to buckle up. It's like Mark Pathy is now in his seat. That suit technician will help them. Uh, be, it's it's more than just a, a seat belt like you and I are accustomed to in a car. It's actually a five-point safety harness. So they'll do an initial um, buckling in, not not to they don't they don't tighten it completely. Um, you know they want people to still be comfortable. Right. You know, they're going to be sitting in in the capsule for <laughs> a little while. Yeah. You know <laughs> we're we're just under three hours until liftoff. Um, so they're going to get in. Tighten that safety harness. Make sure that the the footrest and everything is uh, is comfortable for the crew. Right. Well, and one thing we didn't get to see earlier with the uh, flight suit up room, but they, you know, as they're sitting in and getting suited up, um, you know, they they are allowed to kind of sit back in some chairs to kind of see how do these how do these chairs feel. And um, I think you told me something interesting about you know the seats on these Dragon spacecraft, right? They're kind of yeah, they're customized a little bit for absolutely. So um, while it, they're not custom molded, mm -hmm. they are custom sized. So you can think of it as like small, medium, and large in terms of the size of the bucket that they sit in. So essentially, the length of the the seat from spine to head. Um, you know, everybody's different. We yeah. want to make sure that um, you know during dynamic operations, such as liftoff and yeah. reentry, that the body is ergonomically supported. Um, and so things like that bucket seat, small, medium, a large sized, um, as well as the armrest and the footrests are all um, sized as well because yeah. uh, everybody's different. <laughs> right, right. And, and crew, you know, it's important for them to be as com not only as comfortable as they need to be, but also for, you know, effective use inside inside the capsule during their journey. I um, mean, everybody's got a different role to play uh, on the uphill. And I think one of the things that is, is an important check as crew gets into their seat is not only are they harnessed incorrectly, that the umbilicals are connecting correctly, but also that they're comfortable. Yeah. You know, that they have movement and range to, um, you know, interface with the displays and um, 
and everything else expected of their roles while in orbit. Absolutely. Looks like we're just um, here getting final goodbyes from Aton Stiba. <laughs> I love seeing that. <laughs> As you can tell, um, you know, the SpaceX team and the Axiom team are really close. You know, we've been working together for this day for months. And as we've said a couple of times, you know, everything is really well rehearsed. They've practiced this. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the bonds that are formed between crew members and the support crew, uh, obviously, as we just saw, really tight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it takes a huge team of dedicated, hardworking people to get a mission off the ground. Um, you know, and that's one of the things about these initial private astronaut missions is that's what we're trying to learn. You know, that's, that's what we're trying to um, work towards together, understanding all the collaboration, all the cooperation needs to happen uh, on and off the ground in order to get these missions off the ground and be successful. So over the shoulder there, we can see MLA. Uh, I find it interesting, Kate. It looks like you've got two stickers on the inside of the Dragon ah, capsule. Ah, yes. Just over the head of MLA there. So this capsule has flown twice before. Uh, it previously supported the Crew 2 mission. And before that, it flew on our Demo 2 mission, nice. uh, which for those that might be unfamiliar, that was SpaceX's first human spaceflight mission where we carried NASA astronauts, uh, Bob and Doug, or as we like to call them here at SpaceX, our space dads. <laughs> um, we took them to the International Space Station, um, and it was the first time that uh, NASA astronauts departed for space from American soil um, since the retirement of the, of the space shuttle program. So um, I just, I love this capsule. I've been inside of it. Um, in my previous role, I was in the production organization. And um, so I, I was in this capsule when we were, when we were building it. And I just, it's very near and dear to my heart. So I, I love being able to see it reused yeah. uh, for, for further missions. I mean, that's such a, that's a, that's a reason that, you know, Com the future of spaceflight being commercial and private, you have to have that type of reusability, right? And I think seeing those two patches on there really is a testament to um, to the success and the importance of reusability, but also, you know, showcasing the pedigree of this vehicle. It's, yeah. it's been put through its paces. It's been tried out. Um, crew loves flying it, from what I understand. <laughs> um, and so it's really it's really nice to see that, um, you know, that's indicated with those mission patches on there. It's a nice little, it's a nice little shout out. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, all four crew members uh, have ingressed the vehicle. They are in their seats. And the suit techs, the closeout team uh, on the SpaceX side are doing final checks and um, making sure that everybody is buckled in properly, uh, making sure that, you know, ultimately that the crew is good, doing, doing final uh, FOD, or not final, but doing FOD checks um, for an object debris um, is what I mean when I say FOD. Um, yeah, and just making sure that everything is, is comfortable um, prior to doing seat rotation and comm checks. Right. You know, and one of the other things um, about the, seeing those mission patches, like I, I, I really find mission patches interesting. I think um, they're a really important shout out to what, what is the heart of this mission, right? And so, you know, going into the little bit, that is signaling plays an important role, right, in capturing the soul of a mission. So let's go and take a closer look at the AX-1 mission patch itself. So representing the heart of this mission is the ISS itself with the solar array wings prominently displayed as each crew member's national flag and signifying the key message of this particular mission, international cooperation and collaboration. Behind the ISS, you can see a cascading plane of blue representing Earth's atmosphere and highlighting the journey humanity has taken to get to this new chapter. Above the ISS, four bright stars, anchored by an atom in the center, create a constellation marking the mission's scientific and aspirational objectives. And then finally, the golden border around the patch represents the significance of this mission, this mission to the people of Israel, inspired by the logo of the Rakia banner. So there we can see Commander MLA accessing his crew tablet. Uh, where he is able to monitor mission status and follow along with our procedures. Amazing view of pad 39A with 39B in the background there. Mm -hmm. Gosh, 
what a gorgeous day in Florida. Yeah, <laughs> it's looking like a perfect launch day. Looking at the launch vehicle there, you can see that um, the top half is, you know, has a very bright white color. The bottom half has a little bit more of a grayish color. <laughs> um, in addition to the fact that the Dragon has been reused, we've also reused this Falcon 9 uh, first stage as well. Um, it will be making its fifth flight today. Um, it previously supported the Inspiration 4 mission uh, just a, a few months ago. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's another testament to that reusability that we talked about. Um, without this, these private astronaut missions wouldn't be possible. Yeah. Um, so far, SpaceX has completed 32 Dragon missions, including 29 visits to the International Space Station. Uh, 13 of those 29 missions have been on reflown Dragons, which, saying it out loud, is still just wild yeah, to me. Yeah, that won't it's incredible. <laughs> The Dragon capsule flying today, like we mentioned before, has flown before, um, named Endeavour. It will be making its third trip to space. It previously supported the NASA Crew-2 mission, uh, and before that, Demo-2. As for our launch vehicle, Falcon 9 has completed 145 total launches, over half of those on reflown rockets, like the one that we are using today. And like I said, that booster will be making its fifth flight today. Like you said, it has that well-deserved and well-earned patina mm. <laughs> on that first stage. Yeah, each time a first stage returns to the launch site, uh, you know, we, we put it through a vehicle maintenance program. Um, because we have reusable hardware, uh, we can do thorough post-flight assessments and imp improve reliability and simplicity. Um, so for those of you that might not be familiar with our reuse efforts, uh, we've actually flown one of our Falcon 9 boosters 12 times. <laughs> um, and we have more flights planned for it later this year. So looking a little bit at crew there on, of what we can see on screen, you know, we see, we see Mark, Larry giving those fist bumps. <laughs> we see MLA and then Aton over on the far right. What, what, what can, we, can you tell us a bit about the seat arrangement inside the Dragon Capsule, Kate? Yeah, so um, it's pretty standard in terms of the role that sits where. So if you look at uh, the two center seats, um, the left center seat, always the pilot, the right center seat uh, is always the commander. Um, and then, as I like to call them, the window seats, <laughs> which would be where I would definitely want to fly, yeah. <laughs> um, are for our mission specialists. And those window seats are great for enjoying the view, but um, as we alluded to before, and as we can see through, you know, all of the procedural checks being followed today, discussing crew's training, you know, we know that they have a breadth of mission objectives while they're up there. This is really more than just a trip to space. You know, these guys have a, a very, very large set of uh, objectives that they're going to be achieving on their flight. And they've been in this from day one. You know, they've been training hard. They plan, they train, they fly. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's really it's really highlighting the fact that everybody's got a role to play here and it doesn't stop. Once you get on orbit, they're going to keep on going. For sure. Yeah, just like on orbit, everything is scheduled, choreographed, mm -hmm. same thing on the ground. Um, yeah, the, the procedures that we're following today as we've said before, we've rehearsed this a couple of times, whether live on the pad or in simulations right. at various training centers. Um, so while it is the you know it is the first time that you know it, we can say it's launch day, mm -hmm. um, it is not the first time that they've been in these suits. It's not the first time that they've been in these seats. Um, everything is is well planned. Uh, no surprises. That's exactly. the goal. Exactly. Exactly. Looks like we're getting some final um, some final adjustments with the uh, with the outfitting team there, or the advanced team rather. Yeah. So the next thing that we have coming up will be comm checks with the crew and the various ground support teams, uh, and after that we get to rotate the seats back. And at that point in time, it's really just you know wait yep. <laughs> for the crew. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that moment when you get on a roller coaster, you get buckled in, and you're just you're just sitting there you're ready. and it's, you're just waiting for <laughs> yeah. it to start chugging along. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Although in the case of Falcon 9, it's, it's, it's not really it's, a chug along. Yeah. It's, it takes off. <laughs> yeah.
Well, based on some of the uh, reactions from crew we've been seeing earlier, right? <laughs> seeing a lot of uh, uh, Larry's excitement early in the day. You know, even even as they're they're buttoned in, comm checks would be complete at a certain point, and you're waiting. I don't think the excitement's going to be dying down. So in that shot on the left, you can actually see the Falcon support building just behind the hangar. So hmm. that kind of gives you perspective of how far the crew um, journeyed in their suits right. in those Tesla in the in those Teslas. Right, definitely a walk you can make, but um, if you're going to be in that suit all day long, it may not be one yeah, you want to... <laughs> yeah, I've, I've made that walk many times, and not in a spacesuit, but um, can confirm it's it's a little bit of a hike. <laughs> the incline up to the pad, it catches up with you. Yeah. <laughs> I just love this view of pad 39A, that mm -hmm. part the right of the structure. It looks like a pole that's connected. Mm -hmm. um, that is where the rotating service structure was attached okay. to the fixed service structure uh, back in the shuttle days. So, you know, it's it's just so cool to see the next era of human spaceflight being ushered into uh, reality from this, you know, hollowed ground. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So right now the crew is um, checking in on their tablets and doing final checks with the closeout leads, uh, which are the SpaceX team members that you can see there. Once again, making sure that the five-point safety harness is uh, secure, making sure that everybody's um, boots are able to be uh, buckled into place there on the footrests, making sure that everybody's zippers are closed into the correct position. Um, right now, they don't have to have their visors down, um, so they they're they're still able to you know talk and converse mm -hmm. uh, comfortably. Uh, but we do have their umbilical cords plugged in to the capsule, so um, that umbilical provides communication and and uh, avionics and you know that kind of stuff to the crew. But it also provides provides that cool air, that nitrox mixture um, that we talked about before. Um, which is, you know, same stuff that scuba, diver, scuba divers use in their tanks to breathe underwater. Um, but it just, you know, that cool air flowing through the suit. Because uh, I don't know about you, but if I were sitting in that chair, I would be sweating bullets <laughs> of excitement, just ready exactly. to go. Yeah, I know I certainly would be too. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you have the uh, features ready there to keep crew, you know, comfortable while they're waiting. Um, um, but that also serves another purpose, right? You get to you uh, later when you do your comm checks and you keep your cooling, but it's also, you know, the umbilical for their uphill. For sure. Great shot there of our Axiom 1 crew getting ready for comm checks and uh, seat rotation. I just love seeing these four guys interact with each other. Yeah. Um, as we said before, you can see that the, the bond between the SpaceX team and the Axiom team is really close, but the bond between them is yeah. is also, and I, they just seem like such a fun group. I love seeing Aton dancing yeah. earlier uh, yeah. before while yeah. he was looking at, at the rocket from the ground. Yeah, and I mean, how, how can you not bond with the kind of training that they've gone through, right? And what each, what this mission means to each of them, right? It, it carries a lot of weight for um, for each crew member. You know, uh, we heard a bit about uh, Aton's um, story in particular, um, but they've they've really come to bond over their course of their training. Yeah. So the top part of what we see there, that is the pressurized section of Dragon. That's where our crew is seated. Um, the bottom portion, uh, that's half black, half white. That's the Dragon trunk. Um, that is the unpressurized section. The black side is actually the solar panels that hmm. uh, are utilized to deliver power um, to the capsule while on orbit and on station. That trunk will go up to the space station, but then uh, in 10 days when the crew departs the space station, we will actually jettison the trunk um, prior to splashdown, um, and that allows for the heat shield. Um, SpaceX, Crew Dragon Endeavor here. We're ready for contact. All right, so that was the voice of Commander MLA. Yeah, looks like we're ready for comm checks. Copy Dragon, good morning. Stand by for umbilical comm checks. On the right-hand side of your screen, that is SpaceX uh, Crew Operations and Resources Engineer, or CORE, Arthur Berriolt. 
seated here at Hawthorne Mission Control. CDR, PLT, MS1, MS2, com check. CDR has you loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. MS1, loud and clear. MS2, loud and clear. And core, loud and clear. Umbilical com check is now complete. Stand by for ground station com check. Dragon, SpaceX, com check. SpaceX Endeavor, loud and clear on the ground station. Core, loud and clear. Ground station com check is complete. Stand by for Tedris com check. Dragon, SpaceX, com check. SpaceX Endeavor, loud and clear on Tedris. And core, loud and clear. Tedris com check is complete. Stand by for com checks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, SpaceX, on countdown one, com check. Good morning, Anna, here you loud and clear. Good morning. I hear you loud and clear as well. Stand by for com check over Dragon to ground. Dragon MD on Dragon to ground, com check. Loud and clear on Dragon to ground also. Good morning. MD loud and clear. Stand by for com checks with LD. Dragon LD on countdown one. Com check. They weren't good to be with you this morning. You're loud and clear. And good morning to you too, Michael. I have you loud and clear. Stand by for com check over Dragon to Ground. Dragon LD on Dragon to Ground. Com check. LD Endeavor is still loud and clear. And LD, loud and clear. Godspeed the day, fellas. Let's go have some fun. Indeed. Endeavor SpaceX, launch configuration com checks are now complete. Please report when ready for seat rotation per section 2 of 4 decimal 100. Understand 
second endeavor. We're ready for synchronization. Just over T minus two hours, 23 minutes to launch. Everything continued to go well. Be right now showing the Axiom crew inside the spacecraft. About another minute or so, we ought to begin the seat rotation. Six, we are ready to initiate seat rotation. Okay, we're standing by. Crew is ready. SpaceX advance team is outside of the capsule. They'll watch as we rotate the crews into the launch position. Initiating seat rotation. Nice view watching the seats rotate. Crew displays above them, so we'll get them positioned for launch. A little bit more comfortable uh, recline as we head on out uh, into low Earth orbit. Just Dragon SpaceX seats are in the launch position. Okay, that's what we like to hear. Seats are in the launch position. We're just over two hours, 21 minutes away from the launch of Axiom 1. And as you can see, the four-person crew is in the Dragon spacecraft. They've just completed their communications checks with the ground team. Those checks verified that the communication umbilical is... The Dragon uh, with that, I can give you a go to step through Section 3, Suit Leak Check Preparation. Okay, we've heard the crew giving the uh, go-ahead to do a uh, quick Suit Leak Check. You can see them closing the visors. Uh, they'll do a uh, short, just a, a few minute check to make sure the suit integrity is good. While they're doing that, a little bit of a recap. We did hear the communications checks about five minutes ago. Went through three different paths. The umbilical that's hooked up to the Dragon spacecraft, that separates right at liftoff. Comms were good there to the ground team. We also did uh, communications checks through the radio frequency transmitters, as well as the NASA tracking and data relay satellite that's up in geosynchronous orbit. So all the comm checks were good. Meanwhile, back in Mission Control, we heard uh, the Dragon team also doing the comp checks. Mission Control Center is located here in SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Meanwhile, out at SpaceX Kennedy Space Center. Sounds like we've got good suit leak checks. As I said at Kennedy Space Center, we've got the Falcon and Dragon launch teams. They're in firing room four. Got a great view of the pad on a good weather day. Copy Dragon, with that, give you a go for section four suit leak checks. Ah, sorry. <laughs> it's in work. There we go. Call out to actually begin the timer.
Speaking of the weather, you can see on the left screen the Dragon spacecraft with the crew access arm, blue skies, uh, some light uh, clouds overhead. Weather's very good today. Probability of violation continues at 10%. Mostly that just winds, uh, but uh, nothing really to be concerned about. And the trajectory out over uh, the eastern seaboard of the U.S. headed northeast also looks acceptable. And so the good news is weather is cooperating. Launch vehicle right now looking good. We're powered on, but mostly just monitoring systems. We will continue uh, checking out Falcon 9 uh, at about T minus one hour when we begin a fuel bleed in on the Merlin engines. Dragon team also monitoring the spacecraft. They've done a lot of their significant work earlier, including pressurizing uh, the uh, Draco thruster system, uh, doing an inertial uh, measurement unit alignment. And right now they're working mostly the mechanical activities, getting the crew in, and as we'll see coming up, the uh, hatch closeout, leak checks, and then eventually at T-minus one hour, the advanced team will be leaving the pad. So right now, T-minus two hours, 18 minutes, 10 seconds. All systems continue to be go for an on-time launch this morning of the Axiom-1 mission. Everything continuing to progress nominally in preparation for our launch of the Axiom-1 crew in two hours and 17 minutes. Everyone is, everyone is, as you can see, buckled in their seat. Um, the crew has performed their comm checks. The seats have been rotated back to access those touchscreen panels above them. Uh, and they're currently in progress with their suit leak checks. So basically pressurizing the suits for a certain period of time to make sure that basically all those buttons are zippers, zippered up appropriately and the, the visors are, are locking in place. So we can see them uh, going through those leak checks now. Uh, now, those spacesuits that you see uh, were designed in-house here at SpaceX, and while they look super cool, uh, that's not their primary function. Yeah, uh, the spacesuit is actually a really important extension of the spacecraft itself, uh, and a lot more complex than you would think at just a glance. Here are two members of our spacesuit team, Chris Trigg and Maria Sundin, telling us how this suit came to be. I think one of the things that was important in the development of the suit was to make it easy to use, something that the crew just has to literally plug in when they sit down and then the, the suit kind of takes care of itself from there. So the suit is really kind of one part of the bigger Dragon system. It's really part of the vehicle. So um, we think of it as kind of a suit seat system. So the seat that the crew is in and the suit are in a lot of ways working together. And so it made sense that, that we were designing Dragon in-house to also design the suit. Our spacesuit is completely designed in-house. It's sealed here in Hawthorne, California, in the same building as the rocket and the capsule. The spacesuit is uh, custom made for each crew member, and that is to optimize the fit for the crew member. We definitely wanted to innovate and we wanted it to look inspiring, but first and foremost, we wanted it to be safe and reliable. The spacesuit's primary purpose is to protect the crew in the unlikely event that the cabin were to depressurize. But the suit does a number of additional things. It provides cooling and communication to the crew inside of the suit, it provides them hearing protection, and then the outer layer of the suit is flame resistant, so it provides flame protection as well. When they go, they get in their seats and they plug the suit into the umbilical that's attached to the seat. And the umbilical is providing everything that the suit needs. So it provides um, the avionics or electronics for communications. It's providing the air to cool the suit. And then it also provides gas when needed to pressurize the suit. So it's really a single point that lets the suit do all the things that it needs to do. We designed the helmet in-house. The helmet serves a number of different functions. Obviously, it's protecting the crew's head and it's retaining gas like the rest of the suit, but it also houses the microphones as well as the valves that are, are regulating pressure in the suit. We had to design the gloves so that they would work with the touchscreen so that the crew could use a touchscreen while they were in their suit. But the gloves also still had to do a number of other things like the rest of the suit. And then of course, they have to be able to work under pressure. I think one of the things that's cool about the suit is it's not just a piece of hardware, it's not just a suit. It's a very personal thing to work on for everyone on the team who's been building these, and so it's a, a really amazing thing. 
So about a minute and a half ago, we heard on the nets that uh, we had four good suit leak checks. Uh, so that was the next milestone that we were working through. Um, so good news there. Uh, the crew is continuing to, um, you know, check off things on their to-do list, <laughs> essentially for today. Now, as you might imagine, our crew uh, for today's mission, Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Eitan Stiba, and Mark Pathy have gone through extensive training. Um, as we've mentioned before, mm -hmm. uh, they've logged between 700 and 1,000 hours since mid-2021 um, of time dedicated to learning the SpaceX protocols, International Space Station, space station systems, uh, and ultimately to, to prepare for their respective research portfolios. Uh, to prepare the AX-1 crew for their mission, our teams here at SpaceX have spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in microgravity, and even running simulations of what the full mission will look like while seated in Dragon, as you can see there. Uh, this team has studied nearly 100 different training lessons covering all aspects of the mission. Uh, as the commander, Michael, or MLA, uh, focused on guiding his crew through all of their SpaceX, NASA, and space station training. Our trainers have told us that he has demonstrated exemplary leadership in building a cohesive crew that can tackle any problem that they're given and work together uh, to solve it through effective communication. As the pilot, Larry spent time developing his technical and operational skills as a first-time flyer in order to build a foundation for piloting Crew Dragon. Larry also served as the translator for his mission <laughs> specialists, uh, breaking down the technical data for his crewmates. And as mission specialists, Aton and Mark have spent a majority, majority of their training becoming proficient in operating equipment, interfaces, and a suite of other tools at their disposal uh, to support the crew members throughout the ascent, rendezvous, and return portions of this mission. Right, but you know their training doesn't stop there. Right, <laughs> they had a lot that they had to cover. So the AX1 crew uh, has also completed things like zero G flights to become familiar with the microgravity environment, as well as centrifuge training to experience the exact launch and entry profiles that they'll feel during their mission. Additionally, they went through wilderness survival training to simulate and practice high stress scenarios, as well as medic training to prepare for potential illnesses that they might experience while in orbit. And as the first all-private crew to live and work aboard the International Space Station, they have been training at NASA facilities, specifically NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, since August 2021. Each crew member has completed training in health, safety, space station systems, and emergency protocols to ensure that they can each work autonomously without interrupting the workflow of other astronauts while on board the ISS. And naturally, each crew member has their own portfolio of research they will conduct or participate in. Uh, many of these studies have required the crew to train on the techniques and best practices of their respective uh, principal investigators. So, you know, bottom line, to wrap that up, you know, this crew really is setting the standard in how they approach training, right? They've really exceeded the requirements of the mission, and they've certainly surpassed all of our expectations. Um, and it really highlights that this mission represents more than just the first fully private flight to ISS. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it's establishing many new protocols and means of collaboration between government and private institutions. You know, this crew really wanted to give back to the ISS, and they really wanted to give back to the mission and truly be a part of the team. And to do that, you have to be all in 100%. And so by immersing themselves in their training, they really set that bar high for private space flights and partnership efforts to come. Yeah, for sure. So we can see there our crew members checking in on their tablets, monitoring the, um, the step of the procedure that we're currently working through. Uh, right now, the closeout team there um, at the capsule are performing final interior inspections, um, basically making sure that uh, everything in the cabin is stowed, making sure that, um, of course, the crew members are all buckled in safely, and basically making sure that everything is in the final flight configuration. Um, we don't want anything floating around that's not supposed to be. Um, and uh, during during their, their mission. So um, final interior inspections. Um, after that, the team will perform um, a visual inspection of the hatch in preparation for hatch closure. Uh, so we're, we're continuing to uh, make our way towards T0 uh, at just uh, over almost two hours and 10 minutes. And from now, we're now under two hours and 10 minutes. So um, everything continuing to track nominally in preparation for our instantaneous liftoff yep. moment. <laughs> yep. 
We can yeah. see um, there, once again, the, the tablets that they have allow the crew to uh, monitor the procedures that we're working off of and the um, touch screen screens, mm -hmm. the, the touch screens that they have um, just uh, above their heads there uh, are where they can monitor the active operations of the capsule itself. Um, uh, nothing happening at this moment, but in flight, that will be um, an important piece of telemetry. Right. And that was an important thing, you know, that the SpaceX team when developing the suits had to really pay attention to, right? And we heard uh, Chris mention that just a moment ago. Yep. The development was really important for understanding, you know, they, they knew that was the way forward for um, um uh, for piloting vehicles and for uh, interacting with your vehicle. And so they baked that right into the design of the spacecraft. Absolutely. Something that um, we are very proud of, um, that the fact that Dragon is mostly autonomous, mm -hmm. um, be, thanks to, to software, um, it, for the most part, flies itself. Uh, of course, the crew is trained extensively on how to be a backup um, to, to that software. Um, but for the most part, you know, as you can see, there is no joystick to steer the rocket, right. um, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> um, so, yeah, everything is, is conducted there um, in terms of executing the mission there from those touch screens above their heads. Right. Well, as we uh, watch crew um, button up the rest of their movement, we'd like to take a bit of time now to talk about a keystone objective of the AX-1 mission, science and research. So to help us unpack the breadth of Axiom managed payloads, joining us now is Christian Mainder, Director of In-Space Manufacturing and Research at Axiom Space. Christian, welcome. Hey, thanks. The sun is shining. It's great to be here. Right, Christian. So thank you for joining us. Um, well, increasing the amount of research performed in low Earth orbit is a goal of Axiom's efforts with private astronaut missions like AX-1, and eventually our future Axiom station. So high level, can you share some information right. about all the research happening on AX-1 and Axiom's role to enable it all? Sure. We are, um, we are really fortunate to have a crew that is so dedicated to doing research on this mission. We have over 25 experiments that we're going to be doing during the flight on the ISS, and we have a number of projects that we're doing before and after the flight as well. Um, the crew has prepared tremendously hard for this. Axiom works with the crew to put together these complements and ultimately uh, get everything put together and packaged up for flight, and then ultimately we help the crew get trained and uh, get on their way. They are going to be incredibly busy on orbit. They have very full timelines along the way here, and we're looking forward to seeing each mission day unfold. Yeah, so are we on the ground. We know they've got a very busy uh, week in front of them. Um, you know, and you mentioned how each crew uh, member has their own portfolio. So let's talk a little bit about each crew member specifically. Uh, what can you tell us about Larry's efforts? Well, Larry is uh, really focused on some really key studies with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic that focus on uh, aging and brain health and heart health. And in particular, he's doing a couple projects on the ground that are looking at him as a human subject. And then in flight, he is also going to be doing some experiments with stem cells and with cells, two different kinds of cells, cardiac cells and with... Um, with cells that are looking at aging. And in fact, um, he's working with a PI named uh, James Kirkland at Mayo Clinic, who focuses on cellu cellu cellular excuse me, aging, uh, otherwise known as senescence. And so we've got a clip from uh, Dr. Kirkland to tell you a little bit more. My name's uh, Jim Kirkland. I'm uh, the Nuaber Foundation Professor of Aging Research at Mayo Clinic. I'm also president of the American Federation for Aging Research, and I'm uh, principal investigator on something called the Translational Geroscience Network. I'm a geriatrician, endocrinologist, and internist, but also a PhD molecular biologist, and I'm interested in developing interventions that delay, prevent, or alleviate multiple diseases by going after fundamental aging processes. One of the, the things that we're working on is the cellular senescence program, and the other, my colleague, Andrew Terzik, is looking at cardiovascular issues. And so there are a series of experiments that both of our groups um, are, are doing with Larry and the other um, astronauts' help. The project that uh, my lab's working on and my group's working on is mainly related to a process called cellular senescence. So cellular senescence is a fundamental aging mechanism. Uh, they're what we call the so-called pillars of aging. 
and they're joined together there uh, in what we call a unitary hypothesis. And these fundamental aging processes appear to be root cause contributors to multiple conditions. So the idea is to find out on a short space mission where there's uh, the predominant effect will be zero gravity, some radiation, um, if senescence develops. Larry and his group are also taking up cells that we're providing with them that are what we call pre-senescent. These are human cells in culture. They're going to be tending the cells while they're up there and changing the medium on them. And we're asking whether those cells become senescent in space. So special culture containers had to be developed for this uh, by Axiom, special incubators. And Larry, uh, we're tr we've trained him and his colleagues in how to change the medium. They have to take up these needles. And when he comes back, we'll have parallel cells on the ground uh, that we will compare to the cells that have been up in space and the insights that we will get from the experiments he are, is planning to do, uh, both allowing his own blood and, and other fluids to be uh, analyzed and also by looking after cells that are taken in space could help a lot of people with a lot of conditions that go far beyond space travel to everything from uh, childhood cancer survivors through to Alzheimer's disease. Well, excellent. So essentially, Dr. Kirkland and Terzik are really looking at how microgravity can reveal new mechanisms in cellular aging and cardiac health. And the hope is that what we learn from space is ultimately we can translate to uh, solving age-related conditions on Earth. Really cool to see that. I yeah. just want to note real quick about uh, two minutes ago while that package package was running, we did hear um, from the nets that we did did get the green light to proceed to hatch closure. Awesome. So uh, really good news there. Excellent. Uh, Christian, back to you. Um, what can you tell us about mission specialist Mark Pathy's research portfolio? Well, Mark has got a mission focused around caring for people on the planet. And so he's working with uh, six different universities and their researchers in the Canadian in the, in the the Canadian area. And then he also is working with two uh, startup companies for some, some technology demonstrations. And he's also working with some institutions in Canada to do some Earth observation work. Um, one of the studies that he's particularly focusing on is about pain sensation in space. And he's working with uh, Pablo Angelmo, who is a PI at McGill University and works with the Montreal Children's Hospital. Um, we've got Dr. Angelmo on video here to talk a little bit more about his research and why it's so important. Hi, I'm Dr. Pablo Angelmo. I'm professor of anesthesia at McGill University and director of the Edwards Family Interdisciplinary Center for Complex Pain at the Montreal Children's Hospital. The knowledge we have about the relationship between microgravity and pain is minimal, almost non-existent. We know that half of, pain of the astronaut who goes in the space will experience pain while they are in the space or when they come back to Earth. To better understand why these people have pain, we assembled a research team uh, of the Alan Edwards Center uh, for research on pain of McGill University, from Concordia University, and also from the MD Anderson Hospital Cancer Center in Houston. Uh, this project also involved uh, transfer of technology from the University of Pennsylvania. Our team includes experts in pain sensation, in the genetic mechanism of pain, in bone pain, in interventional dis degeneration, and in musculoskeletal, spine imaging, and rehabilitation. The novelty of our project is that we are trying to answer several questions from different perspectives and different angles in a single study. But in reality, we are conducting six studies in one. We are not looking just for the abnormalities in people who have pain, but we want to understand why some people get better after an acute insult like microgravity. That happened every day in Earth. We plan to incorporate that information collected from astronauts into animal models, which may lead to application in humans, and eventually in different ways to treat them. Our hope uh, is that information we collect with, will advance on research on help people here on Earth. I would say that Mark Patty and 
and his colleagues are giving us their time before, during, and after the flight. This will create new models of analysis for helping people in pain here every day. I'm very grateful for their commitment and generosity. As Dr. Indelmo talks about, this is some really novel research. This complex package of work that he's put together is really uh, setting out to understand more about the dynamics of short-term spaceflight and, and pain sensation in space. And the hope is, again, the things that we learn in space will, will play their way back into ground interventions that we can do that help people with pain on Earth. Yeah, Christian, I think, you know, the, the main takeaway for me is showing, you know, research like that really highlights the direct impacts that we can get from uh, research done on orbit. It's not all indirect. Um, but, you know, moving yep. on to rounding out the mission, right? We know that Aton has a significant amount of work in front of them. So what can you tell us more about uh, Aton's time on orbit? Well, Aton has put together a impressive complement uh, along with the, he has worked carefully and closely with the Ramon Foundation in Israel and the Israeli Space Agency. Um, the focus of his mission, he's named, they've named their mission Rakia, which really tr loosely translates to sky or firmament. But it's really a package of research that spans. My name is Inbal Kreis, as the Head of Innovation, System, Missile and Space Division at Israel Aerospace Industries, I led the scientific and technological program of the Rakia mission. The Rakia mission will allow Israeli scientists, entrepreneurs and students to test their experiment in the unique space environment. All the experiments in Rakia mission led by Eitan Stibe are innovative and were chosen by scientific committee based on their impact potential. 35 experiments arise from diverse fields of studies such as astrophysics, optics, radiation, communication, energy, agriculture, neurology, plasma technology, disease research, new therapies development, and many more. For example, in optics, the Fluid Lenses Experiment, a joint project of the Technion and NASA aims to enable, for the first time, the creation of optical components in space. In neurology, we are testing how we can take advantage of the conditions of microgravity to improve drug delivery to the human brain. An experiment of device to protect space systems from cosmic radiation. This technology will enable the use of commercial electronics in space environment. Testing recycling in space, the effect of microgravity on the rate of decay of plastic by bacteria. In agriculture, growing specific seeds in space as superfood and also for water purification, making the impossible possible. This is what makes Israel a startup nation, Israel the innovation nation. AX-1 and Rakia mission are positioning Israel as a leading technological player in the global space community. I look forward to exciting scientific and technological results. Good luck. Well, the whole country of Israel is really excited about Eitan's mission, and I think for me what's most compelling about the Rakia mission is how it really is going to act as a catalyst for the innovation in country to really take advantage of uh, new opportunities in space for both profit and discovery. And so uh, we're really excited to move forward with this mission, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna really knock out a lot of science with Eitan. Yeah, certainly. You know, it's incredible to think that so many of these new studies are being given time on station because of the efforts of this crew and Axiom Space. But beyond the specific studies we've just highlighted, you know, there are several others that Axiom has been managing and will manage. Uh, can you share with us a little bit more about these? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. We, we at Axiom are also using this flight to really further research and technology development that we think either has uh, plays a role in developing new in-space manufacturing applications or research applications in the future uh, and also maybe technologies that will help build future spacecraft so we have a project where we're looking at stem cells to understand more about precancer and cancerous changes in tumors we have 
uh, research that we're doing on the crew with uh, partners in, in Houston to understand more about what it means to keep a more diverse population healthy in space. Um, we're flying some really cool technology that is autonomous and self-assembly of different panels in space that will ultimately play a role in building new spacecraft uh, autonomously in orbit. And we're even flying uh, a new technology that uses light to remove odors from the cabin and uh, probably super important on a mission like this where you're going to have 11 people on board for, for 10 days together. So uh, a lot of different things that we're breaking out and more, more that I can't even talk about here. but. Um, a lot, a lot that we're adding to the cruise mission that we have on orbit. Well, Christian, that's great to hear. Thank you for walking us through the scope of AX1's research objectives. We're obviously going to be staying uh, uh, very, very well aware of these over the next few days. So, you know, this crew is really setting the bar high and adding all the volume of science that's being conducted on board. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So as you can see uh, there on your screen, the side hatch has been closed. Uh, the crew is now in the capsule. Mm -hmm. um, the door has been shut. So we, the closeout team did those final checks with the crew to make sure that they're ready to go to space today. Yep. Um, so they closed the side hatch. They performed a leak check uh, where they basically inflate a seal around the side hatch um, and hold it at a certain pressure for a certain amount of time uh, and make sure that the seal is good. Um, so that side hatch has been closed. Uh, the closeout crew and the suit technicians are still on the exterior, as you can see there on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and they are um, preparing to finish things up and then we'll be stepping into comm checks um, with the crew and our ground teams here on the ground. Right, and like you mentioned, Kate, you know, it's inch by inch to get us into space, right? We take steps all along the way to make sure, are we getting good comm checks? Good. Are we getting good leak checks? Good. All right, now let's close the hatch and let's check it out again, yep. right? So it's all part of the process that this crew's uh, a part of and that all crews on the ground are a part of to make sure that we have a successful mission today. And, you know, I think crews now at that spot that you were talking about earlier, all right, we're ready. I see that, I see that hatch closed and I know I got good comms. Let's get to space. <laughs> yeah, watching that seat rotation is always an exciting moment for me because you can see mm -hmm. expressions change. Yeah. You can see body language change uh, because that seat rotation back into the launch position um, for the crew is the final physical movement that they right. have uh, prior to liftoff. Right. <laughs> so um, it's always fun to watch. Now the crew's there on the left-hand side of your screen again. Um, that we're performing the, 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 excuse me, we're performing the leak check on the side hatch. Um, and you can see the tablets there, um, the crew is using to follow along with the data that's coming in um, from that leak check as well as just monitoring where we are uh, in the closeout process. Um, as I've said a couple of times already, everything is extremely well choreographed. Um, every step of the procedure is documented um, down to details like you know, make sure there's a Sharpie yep. uh, in the white room yep. prior to crew's arrival to make sure that they can add their name to the wall of signatures <laughs> that you see there. Um, so everything is very well documented and um, that's what the crew is tracking there on those tablets, um, our, our e-procedures, electronic procedures. Right now we're about two minutes uh, into the five minute wait for that leak check. So like I said, um, we inflate the seal around the side hatch and hold it at a pressure for five minutes and uh, monitor that data to make sure that it, that it holds that pressure for the five minutes. After this leak check completes, um, we will step into comm checks with the crew. Uh, and that's basically a, um, how do I want to phrase this? A roundabout with the crew and all the ground systems to make sure that um, communication lines are loud and clear mm -hmm. uh, for the crew. Right, and followed by that, it's just marching down towards T0, right? We have, um, you know, launch escape system checks being armed after that, closeout team will depart and the crew armor tracks and we just keep working our way towards launch. Yeah, yep. Which uh, now just about one hour and 15 minutes away. So once the leak check for the side hatch completes and the closeout team departs the white room and ultimately the tower, 
Um, it's a lot of waiting for the crew. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a lot of excitement. Oh, the seats are rotating. Yeah. It's happening. And then it's wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, and while we're waiting for those checks, let's take a little closer look at the crew again today. So serving as commander for this mission is Michael Lopez Alegria, or MLA, as you've heard some of us call him. Uh, he's a veteran of three space shuttle flights, one Soyuz flight, and numerous space walks. Actually check. Go ahead. Check. All right, MLA, they were seeing some uh, leak rate trending in the wrong direction, so we're going to reopen the side hatch temporarily, uh, try and clean off that seal, and then reclose the side hatch to reperform the side hatch leak check. I'll copy. Okay, Arthur, we'll copy next time. All right, so that was just a note from SpaceX core Arthur Burial to the crew to let them know that, that we're going to reopen the side hatch. Um, it sounds like that. Uh, as I mentioned before, we inflate the seal around the side hatch and uh, hold it out of pressure. Sounds like um, we saw just a little bit of pressure loss there in that leak check. So we're going to reopen it and wipe down everything along that seal um, to see if we can get that to close up properly. Right, and as, as Kate mentioned, we heard that conversation between CORE and uh, MLA. So, you know, taking a closer look at MLA here while we wait for those leak checks, you know, this will be his third trip to the International Space Station. Uh, his last one was Expedition 14, where he also served as mission commander. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the commander of AX-1, Michael Lopez Alegria. Michael, I want to know what the first time the feeling was when you got outside of the space shuttle. What was that feeling like? <laughs> You know, most astronauts that have been to space will talk about the overview effect. Basically, it's a, a change in perspective. You know, these experiences are really unique. So I'm trying not to set expectations for the crew because I really want them to have their own interpretation of what it's like. American spaceflight record that by uh, former NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria. 215 days in space, 213 of which were on the International Space Station. In 2004, I was assigned to fly a long duration mission to the ISS. My two crewmates on the Soyuz would be a cosmonaut and then a spaceflight participant. And I wasn't too keen with that idea. And the few weeks that I spent training with her and the 10 or so days I spent on orbit with her completely changed my view. It has been a complete 180 degree change of direction. And I went from refusing the Kool-Aid to pouring the Kool-Aid. The thing about LA that's special is his patience and his skill, competence, his trustworthiness. He's well suited to be a commander of any space mission. AX-1 is the first private mission to the International Space Station. We are setting the standard for all future human spaceflight to the ISS, and we take that obligation very, very seriously. Our guys have been training for months, and they're trying to get a lot done, especially when it comes to scientific experiments and outreach. But I want them to really enjoy the experience, and I want them to come home with a big smile on their face. SpaceX training it's like being a kid in a candy store. A new vehicle, love the human interface with it. It's a really exciting and inspiring place. I mean, he's feeling nostalgia already. Just by going through the training process and being back in, in the business of preparing for a space flight, it's something I know he's enjoying thoroughly. I've been involved with Axiom, which started out literally as a handful of people in 2016 to where it is today. I really tip my cap to all of the people here at Axiom. Hey, boss, don't screw up. <laughs> I'm Michael Lopez Alegria, and I'm the commander of AX-1. Larry Connor is Axiom One's pilot. Larry's experience in piloting over 16 types of aircraft and multiple deep ocean dives sets him well for this role aboard AX-1. While on board, Larry will conduct numerous experiments in conjunction with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic. Here's a closer look at Larry Connor. Well, Larry, I always start with the big, broad question. Why? Well, it's a big opportunity and a big challenge. And you're no stranger to extreme activities, right? 
Well, I don't classify them as extreme activities. I understand other people would. Larry is an entrepreneur and nonprofit activist investor. Larry Connor will be the pilot for that mission. The pilot is a person who is there to be equally technically proficient as the commander and back them up. My pilot, Larry Connor, American businessman, he comes across as a no-nonsense guy. The words I would use to describe him are focused, organized, driven, and he's a real team player. I was really clear to accent him right from the beginning. I didn't want to be a space tourist. I didn't want to go up there and sit. This was an opportunity not only to do exploring, but hopefully make a difference. Well, Larry and the other astronauts are doing a couple of sets of studies, the one with respect to heart function, the other with respect to these fundamental aging processes. And the insights that we will get could help a lot of people with a lot of conditions from childhood cancer survivors through to Alzheimer's disease. One of the things that Larry has been doing is he's been incredibly generous with helping support clinical trials, determining once and for all whether some of these interventions work. Our goal and our hope is, is to try to help revolutionize how we think about and how we serve and how we help people. He wants to do a good job. He, he's putting in the efforts to support his crewmates and just, you know, make an example of what private space flight could be. I just wish the world were filled with people like him. He's generous and thoughtful, and I just can't think of enough positive things to say about him. You have to recognize all of the people up and down the line, they've simply been exceptional. We've got a really talented, committed, resilient group of individuals. Amazing things really are possible. Hi, I'm Larry Connor, and I'm the pilot on AX1. Now coming to Aton Stiba, serving as mission specialist, Aton has a significant mission ahead of them in terms of objectives, as we talked with Christian earlier about. Working with the Ramon Foundation and the Israel Space Agency at the Ministry of Science and Technology, Aton will be focusing on everything from genetic diagnostics to arts and science outreach. Here's a closer look at Aton's story. I mean, what was your first spark to want to fly? That's an interesting question. As a kid, I would close my eyes and dream that I was flying like Superman that I saw on TV. Actually, I went to sleep every night in this position. F-16 is a beautiful aircraft. It gives the pilot a, a feeling of freedom, freedom in the three dimension. You just look at somewhere and pull the stick and the aircraft performs what you wish. He has this inner drive. You see it shine or spark when he's exposed to new cultures. My dad has been in the last decade, his heart has been into impact investments to create infrastructure and to help communities. The Rakia mission was built in the same manner to draw on the curiosity associated with human space travel, to conduct a wide range of experiments, educational studies, and even artistic activities. ראינו שחקר החלל מגרה את כל החושים, מעורר סקרנות, אפילו מאתגר את הדמיון הפרוע ביותר. רקיה פאץ'. It has רקיה written on it in English, Hebrew, and Arabic, and one dot up above for the memory of Elon Ramon. Even though Israel is a technological country, Space is something that ignites a, a curiosity. It's a, unreachable, it's far away. One of my objectives in the mission is to change the sentiment in Israel about human space flights, to inspire children to look up to the sky and imagine things that are not possible and try to reach them. It's just full power. Lift off. The thrust of Falcon 9 is like two squadrons of F-16s in full afterburner. That power is incredible. I sat inside the simulator of the Dragon, looked up and imagined 
how that would feel. I think it's gonna be the most beautiful thing in the world, seeing this literally take off and seeing all the ideas and all the effort that has been done come to life. It's gonna be beautiful. There is an African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And I'm happy that so many Israeli entities and people can join this effort. My name is Eitan Stibbe. I'm a mission specialist on AX1. Mark Pathy is one of AX1's mission specialists. A longtime philanthropist, Mark will be working with the Canadian Space Agency as well as Montreal Children's Hospital to conduct a number of experiments on vital organ monitoring, ocular health, and pain management. Let's hear a little more from Mark. In your mind, as you're driving at the pad site, would you have a drive-up song? To get to that moment where I'm sitting in the seat, buckled in, and that countdown's beginning. Three, two, one. I imagine what it's going to feel like physically in terms of lifting off from the surface of the earth. It's hard for it to always seem completely real. Then a whole other chapter opens and a whole other adventure begins. I'm very glad to start my training. I've been waiting for a long time. The anticipation's been killing me. Now here we are today. I'm ready. As a proud Canadian, it was important to me to really highlight Canadian universities and Canadian research institutions and to give opportunities to those researchers and those organizations that they might not otherwise have. Mark was entirely committed to developing this mission as a scientific mission. And the theme of the mission was caring for the planet, caring for its people. We're going to be testing new technologies that can help us explore space, staying longer and going farther, but more importantly, can help change our lives here on Earth. There'll be a lot of physical and psychological studies that uh, I'll be participating in up there. A lot of the research that I'm undertaking involves uh, using me as a lab rat because that's uh, that's the best way I can contribute. A lot of what one experiences in space, in terms of inflammation, in terms of pain, psychological feelings of isolation, those are things that affect sick kids. To me, I would like to think that I'll leave this world a better place than I found it. The crew is setting a high standard for private astronauts in the future because they're dedicated to science, they're dedicated to the mission, they're able to learn all these objectives, they are building in educational outreach. It's really exciting watching this come together. I'm very excited to work with you to complete your science experiments and your educational outreach when you get on board ISS. We know you guys are prepared and we'll be supporting you here from Mission Control in Houston. There's a lot of people, some that I know and many that I don't that uh, deserve my appreciation and thanks and gratitude for getting me here. I'm Mark Pathy and I'm a mission specialist on AX1. We're currently T minus one hour, 36 minutes, 27 seconds. As the Axiom One crew awaits its 11, 17, 12 a.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time liftoff from Launch Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. Now currently, as uh, you see a little bit on the left there, the crew is inside the Dragon capsule. We closed the side hatch a little bit earlier. We began the five minute leak check. Uh, we stopped that, they saw a little bit of a leak and they reopened the hatch starting about 12 minutes ago. You can see they're getting ready to close the hatch again. Uh, they cleaned the seal off. Uh, nothing significant noted, but uh, give it a good wipe. We're closing up and then we'll try to repeat the leak check here very shortly. Once we get through that, we're also waiting to hear the crew perform communications checks with the Falcon ground team. Uh, that'll be a check out with some of the responsible engineers who you'll also hear during the ascent calling out status, propulsion engineer, avionics engineer, guidance nav and control, uh, as well as chief engineer. Earlier we did have the communications checks with the Dragon team. We heard that going through a variety of routes. Uh, that would be the umbilical, uh, the radio frequency transmitters, 
and of course the NASA TDRS satellite up in geosynchronous orbit. So currently the weather, uh, when we get a view of the pad, the weather continues to be go for launch, uh, as well as any contingencies. For example, if a launch escape was required during ASCET, weather conditions in the Atlantic Ocean off of the eastern seaboard of the U.S. as we head northeast towards the space station, those conditions are go. Uh, the upper altitude winds for Falcon 9 as we steer through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, those also look good right now. And of course, contingency uh, splashdown locations uh, that we would use in case the crew had to come back down out of orbit, they're also looking good. Now coming up in about 35 minutes, that's when things start to get active on Falcon 9. We'll begin the fuel bleed in on the Merlin engines. Uh, let a little bit of propellant onto the vehicle, bleed it through the engines, that's getting them ready for the ignition sequence inside of T minus two seconds. And of course, as we said, the Dragon uh, team, the advanced team that's on the pad, they have to repeat the side hatch leak check. Good news is we've still got time in the schedule, uh, and we have seen this before. If you've been with us on one of the crew missions, we also had a leak where we had to reopen the hatch, clean the seal, close it up, and then it passed. But that advanced team, once we get through that and we finish putting on the last covers for flight, uh, deflate some of the seals uh, and get ready to uh, uh, get out of the pad, they'll leave uh, the pad area and the crew access arm at T minus one hours. Also a little bit earlier, we did a launch escape system checkout on Dragon. That came at about T minus one hour and 52 minutes. It's mostly just checking all the telemetry of the systems that are required in the launch escape safety system. Everything checked out well, and that's a standard part of the launch countdown. And it's critical to make sure that everything Dragon, is in working order. We are closing the side hatch again, and we'll step into the next round of side hatch lead checks. Copy on SpaceX. And we've heard the call out. Uh, you can see the advanced team, they're closing the hatch. Uh, looks like they're uh, torquing up uh, to the required uh, uh, load. Uh, we then begin a pressurization sequence for a few minutes, and then we hold it for five minutes. And then, fingers crossed, we'll get a successful leak check. We'll get into the communications checkouts and proceed on to the T-minus one hour and uh, countdown to an on-time launch. But right now, Kate, John, everything continues to look good out of Pad 39A. We have to recommence the help checks for the launch escape system with the second hatch closure. Expect a momentary flight computer state change. And one other update, uh, you just heard the launch escape health checks. Those are the ones I said that we did about 20 minutes ago. Uh, you do them as you close the hatch. Now that we open it up, we close it again, they'll repeat that checkout. Uh, that just takes a minute to verify all the telemetry on the launch escape systems are still within specification. So everything continuing to go well at 39A other than working through a second hatch leak check. Fingers crossed that we'll see an on-time launch at uh, 11, 17, 12 a.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. So as John and I said, we have um, we're, we're now in the process of redoing the side hatch closure and leak check. Um, so the team uh, saw a little bit of uh, loss of pressurization whenever we were conducting that leak check. Um, not a huge deal. Just reopen it. They wiped down the the seal itself. Um, didn't really know anything significant. So now they have reclosed it and we're now re-performing that leak check. The crew remains seated and comfortable there on the right-hand side of your screen uh, inside uh, Dragon Endeavor. Yeah, well, as we wait for that, um, um, you know, I wanted to talk about a bit, like a major objective of this mission is outreach and, you know, getting more people interested in space flight, but more importantly, finding ways to connect us together. And some of the best ways to do that are through art and shared experiences with art. So for this mission, we asked artist Michael Kagan, known for his space themed artwork, to create an exclusive new piece that commemorates the AX-1 mission. And he created the spacewalker that you see on your screen there. 
So this digital asset can be enjoyed as an augmented reality spacewalker that anyone can check out and play with. And here's how it works. I, I got to play with this a little bit yesterday. It's pretty cool. Um, but we'll have a QR code for everyone at home to scan with your phone. And the spacewalker will become an AR model on your phone that you can play with. Uh, you can adjust the scale and position, uh, position it as you want, rather, and then snap a photo with it wherever that spacewalker is. Um, it's actually pretty fun. Uh, I got to kind of play around with them. We walked around here a little bit and popped a spacewalker over there and took a photo. Of it. It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So um, at home, we'd love to see what you can do with it. So be sure to tag any posts with the hashtag AX1. That is AX and the number one. Yeah. I personally, I'm not really into NFTs, uh, but that is beautiful. Um, yeah. This might be what gets me in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as you said, that's not it, right? We're taking this one step further uh, with the goal of encouraging people all over the world to have some fun with this mission. Uh, we are announcing that the AX1 crew is going to mint the Spacewalker as an NFT from space. So for all of those NFT collectors out there, the Axiom NFT marketplace is launching right now. And over the course of this mission, it will feature digital artwork, just like Michael Kagan's Spacewalker there, associated with this historic mission. Mission. Uh, so if you'd like to join, the website is nft.axiomspace.com, and it is going live right now. So we'll be announcing the live auction for the Spacewalker NFT during the mission. So be sure to visit nft.axiomspace.com for more info over the coming days. And that's where you're going to find the QR code to the augmented reality Spacewalker. So again, head to nft.axiomspace.com, scan the QR code, Go have some fun, play with a spacewalker, put them wherever you want, and have a blast with them. Super cool. Yeah. So uh, just a quick check-in. You can see there Falcon 9 remains on the pad. We are continuing to count down to our liftoff uh, at just under one hour and 30 minutes from now. As you can see on the right-hand side, the crew are in their seats, uh, and the team on the left is conducting the leak check of that side hatch. Uh, for those of you that have just joined us recently, we did uh, attempt to close the side hatch earlier, closed it, um, but when we performed that leak check initially, saw a uh, very small lo loss of pressure there. So we, we reopened it, and then the teams wiped down the seal, inspected it, um, didn't really know anything major, yeah. so closed it back up, and uh, we're now performing that leak check once again. Um, the process for that is basically we inflate the seal that is around the side hatch, um, and we leave it inflated for five minutes. We monitor... Um, uh, that pressurization, and uh, once it holds that pressure for five minutes, um, we get the the green light. Yeah, you know, and as John and I mentioned earlier too, you know, it's not uncommon for things like this to happen, and that's why we have checks in place, and we have things like verifying end items, and you know, it's a huge part of what the ground control team here plays is, you know, verifying that. Uh, those leak rates, like what you talked about, you know, are you holding a leak rate for the right amount of time and at the right pressure? And what does your trending data look like? So, you know, it's all part of the huge network of teammates on the ground that are uh, supporting the mission and just making sure that every step along the way is safe. And Dragon SpaceX for post ingress briefing. Go ahead, Arthur. All right, MLA. Uh, while we continue through the side hatch leak check. It continues to look like a great day to fly. Dragon, Falcon, and 39 Alpha all look good to fly. Systems are nominal, and we have no deltas to the pre-briefed emergency deorbit sites. That's about as good as the fourth we can ask for. Thanks. Ah, I concur with that. And for awareness, we will be stepping into Falcon 9 op operator comm check shortly. All right, that voice that you just heard uh, was Arthur Berrialt, our uh, SpaceX core, who uh, basically is the primary communicator uh, between the teams here on the ground and the crew. Um, really important role because, you know, for us, we can we can see what's going on. We, we've got the views here, um, but think about it for the crew. Um, you know, they can't they can't really see what's on the other side no. of that side hatch. So um, important updates there to keep them informed. Uh, that being said, you know... Dragon, GNC will begin the uh, Falcon 9 operator comm check with you at this point. Go ahead, GNC. Dragon, GNC on countdown one, comm check. you loud and clear, Cyrus Honey. GNC loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by propulsion engineer. 
Dragon, prop on countdown one, com check. Prop, Endeavor, you're loud and clear, Charles. Prop, loud and clear, stand by for com check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, com check. Avionics, Endeavor, good morning, Colin. Avionics, loud and clear. Stand by for a comm check by the ground segment engineer. Dragon, ground segment on countdown one, comm check. Loud and clear, Andrew. Good morning. Good morning. Ground segment has you loud and clear. Stand by for a comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, com check. Launch control, endeavor, you're loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear, stand by for com check by the chief engineer. Dragon, com check uh, from chief engineer. Good morning, chief engineer, this is Endeavor, you're loud and clear. This completes the Falcon 9 Responsible Engineering Comp Checks. Godspeed. Thank you. All right, there you just heard the completion of the comm checks. Uh, basically, the ground teams, the various uh, leads for the ground systems here, um, going around and um, making sure that the communication pathway to the crew is clear, loud and clear, as you mm -hmm. heard them say. Mm -hmm. um, voices that we heard there included SpaceX Corps' Arthur Berrialt, um, the chief engineer for this mission, uh, Bill Gerstenmayer, um, and yeah, just around the horn for those comm checks uh, with the crew. On the left-hand side of your screen, just a quick check-in. Um, the team there is performing the recheck, or excuse me, yeah, the recheck for that side hatch closure. Um, so we did attempt to close the side hatch and um, perform a leak check, and we saw just a very slight deep loss of pressure it, during that leak check. So we opened it back up, wiped it down. Teams didn't know anything major um, when they inspected it. So now we've reclosed it uh, and we are reperforming that leak check, which includes uh, basically pressure, put it, getting it up to pressurization or pressure uh, three minutes and then holding it at that pressure for five minutes. Um, so right now we're in that five minute wait period. So. Um, you know, as you can tell for the crew, it's a lot of waiting. It's, yep. <laughs> we do this and now we wait. Yep. And now we do this yep. and then we wait. Hurry up and wait, as they say. Yeah, and as and Kate, as you mentioned, um, and as uh, and as we heard, you know, on the concurrently while we're doing that um, that re that repress and recheck, you know, uh, we are also trying to concurrently perform those com checks, right, and and gain some time back as well. So crew, as they're in their vehicle waiting, um, you know, they're they're still they're still on track for their mission, right? They're still zeroed in on exactly what they've got to do, exactly how they can provide assistance and providing and following their procedures and working with the ground teams um, to stay on track for, for sure. And it's worth noting, you know, we do build margin into um, the timeline for this exact reason. If you followed our uh, space flight, our human space flight missions before, sometimes you hear the core indicate that we have X amount of minutes of margin. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for this exact reason, um, you know, we, we do build in that margin. And as I said uh, earlier, you know, the countdown itself is what aligns all the various teams working to support the launch on the same timeline. So it makes it's what makes sure that everybody syncs up. And so allowing us to, um, you know, perform those com checks while doing the repress and recheck, um, you know, just making sure that all those teams are continuing to, to remain aligned. Yeah. You know, I think during this you know, waiting period too. Crew sitting there thinking about not only what do I have to do today, you know, right now, like I'm waking up and I'm getting my suit checked out. There are steps all along the way, and I can only imagine what they're, how they're thinking about what their mission is ahead of them, right? All of the work that we've heard that they're trying to accomplish on orbit, their objectives, you know, they're sitting there thinking, how can I be the most effective I can be over the next eight days, right? Um, and so I'm just thinking about the things that they're 
bringing up there with them, right? Little mementos that they're bringing up there with them. We heard some interesting things, um, you know, during their pre-briefing uh, last week. Uh, certain tokens and mementos of home that they're bringing up and what that means to them. It all plays a part of this mission, what kind of keeps them going through these waiting periods, you know, thinking about what am I going to do up there? What does this mean to me? What does it mean to the people back home? Um, and they're just ready to get up there and start working towards those objectives. So we're continuing to monitor the recheck of that side hatch closure. The team is performing that leak check now. Should be wrapping that up pretty soon. Once we get the leak check confirmed. Greg, SpaceX, good side hatch leak check. Good news, Arthur, thanks. All right, great news Fantastic. there. You might, you might have heard some clapping here. Yeah, yeah. Um, for now, for I should mention, um, you know, we're John and I here, are located at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Um, I actually hear some beeping yeah. now. We are a, a live operations environment <laughs> here in the rocket factory. Yep. Um, so the you know we're one hour and eighteen, uh, just over one hour and eighteen minutes. Um, until launch and we're starting to see people gather and yep. and uh, really, you know, the excitement is starting to build and just hearing the confirmation that that leak check was good, yep. that side hatch is gonna stay closed. Um, you know, the crew is, I think at that moment, you know, as I mentioned before, the seat rotation, that's an exciting moment because yeah. it's like, you know, it's like you're locked into the roller coaster and, yep, and you're you know, ready here to we go. go. And now hearing that that side hatch is good, it's closed, and it's gonna remain closed um, until they splash back down. So when the crew ingresses and egresses from the space station, they will use the forward hatch. So that side hatch now will remain closed until they return to Earth after splashdown. Right, that's a huge step forward in today's launch. So, in addition to the scope of the science and research and outreach being performed on this mission, uh, AX-1 is also taking some time to better understand the role that food plays on orbit. A partner on this mission and a good friend of Axiom Space is Chef Jose Andreas and the team at Think Food Group. Known for his visionary culinary creations and humanitarian efforts, Chef Jose's World Central Kitchen is doing important work helping to feed those who are displaced. Chef Jose also prepared the meals and snacks accompanying our crew to the ISS. In space, astronauts have limited kitchen equipment and ingredients on hand, so having already prepared meals that are both appetizing and comforting is a great way to feel connected to home. Right, so joining us now is Chef Sharice Gray, who you saw in that video, Director for Research and Development at Think Food Group. Chef, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Chef, clearly Think Food Group is doing instrumental work in bringing people together with food uh, and has for a long time. What has been your team's mantra or ethos when it comes to creating these new dishes? Well, you know, I think Food Group, you know, our mission is to change the world through the power of food. And that's why we're so incredibly proud to partner with Axiom Space to have created the meals for the AX-1 Mountain National Crew headed to the International Space Station. Um, as Chef Jose Andres often talks about building longer tables, this is such an extraordinary opportunity to do just that, um, bringing together the hardworking AX-1 crew through food, um, reaching all the way to space. So as a partner on AX1, the culinary teams at Think Food Group have developed a meal to be shared amongst the crew in space on the space station. Uh, what did you put together? So the partner on the food uh, mission was born on a friendship between Chef Jose and fellow Spaniard and veteran astronaut Michael uh, Lopez Alegria, the commander of the upcoming mission. And as a result, we really wanted to lean on the flavors and traditional dishes of their native Spain. So we've made secreto de cerdo with pisto, which is a prized cut of Iberico pork with tomatoes, onions, eggplant, and peppers. And the second meal is chicken and mushroom paella. Uh, paella is, you know, Spain's quintessential rice dish, and the AX1 uh, crew will be able to enjoy also along with that some Spanish jamón, salchichón, and marcona almonds. 
Super cool. Uh, now, can you tell us a little bit more about the significance of those choices? You know, we wanted to be sure that we um, created meals that were not only nutrient rich, but satisfying and really delicious. Um, unlike, you know, traditional ready to eat meals that are designed for quick consumption. As chefs, we understand the importance of really, you know, bold and memorable flavors and created food that you'd really want to eat anywhere in the world or in this case, out of this world. Exactly right. So, so what were some of the challenges that you faced in trying to prepare those meals for out of this world? To make meals that are going to be traveling, you know, for over 250 miles away and, you know, putting in the forefront really crew member safety, uh, they had to be very carefully prepared. And so the AX1 crew meals were thermostabilized through the retort process. Now, your teams also put together a set of snacks that the crew is taking with them to enjoy uh, at various points on their journey to the ISS. Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a few of those extra packets, and we'd love to share a snack together with you. Uh, what do we have here? So you're holding one of the pouches of the actual meals. Um, so uh, let me see what you've got there. It looks like you might have got the piece, though, or the rice. I the think rice. I have, have the, the rice. Valencia rice with chicken. Yes. yes. And I just spilled well, it everywhere. There's <laughs> a piece, though, there. Mm. Wow, just immediately the aroma yeah. just is it's strong. It's it's in a very good way. Yeah. It's, it's My mouth is already watering. Well, and that's John, what that, do you have? Yeah, so I've got I've got the pork stew, um, and I've got to say the same. The, the the aroma I think is really what is really what I would appreciate if I was on orbit and opening this up for the first time. Right? We've heard uh, so much, especially on the crew system side at Axiom. You know how much aroma plays into you know just enjoying your meal, and that can go away uh, during your time on orbit. So I think it's a really important um, aspect to consider when you're preparing meals. Oh, but also mm. snacks are super important. So, you know, along with those meals, the AX1 uh, astronauts will also be able to enjoy like some really Spanish uh, delicacies such as jamón ibérico de beota, um, jamón salchichón from Fermín, um, casas de Juelo olive oil, and marcona almonds by Albert Adria. This is way better than I would have anticipated. Yeah, yeah I've got to say, this is amazing, Chef Cherise. Yeah. Thank you very much for putting this together, and thank you for letting us enjoy it. Mm. You know, and um, you know, I was talking earlier about the, the importance of that aroma plays, right, and being able to enjoy your meal. And we've often heard crew members reflect on how there's really just no better way uh, to see a world without borders up there than just simply looking out the window while in orbit uh, and enjoying some time together. So, you know, something as simple as sharing a meal, right, together, but while looking back at home, can really be a pivotal step in coming to that realization together. So thank you very much for putting this together for our crew. Thank you for working with them. And thank you for joining us today and letting us enjoy this together. So we wish you and the Think Food Group uh, as much success as possible. And we look forward to hearing how it turns out on orbit. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for allowing us to be part of such a moment. Thank you for sharing that with us. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well. So Sorry. After you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, uh, you know, at Axiom, we are hard at work building the next destination in low Earth orbit. And Axiom Station is being designed as a true continuation and evolution of the International Space Station. So, so much gained over the last 20 plus years in orbit. You know, Axiom's goal is to build upon the successes and lessons learned over that time while bridging the gap between the ISS and commercial spaceflight. Ultimately, allowing greater access to that knowledge and capability ensures that humans continue to benefit from time spent in low Earth orbit. Axiom's first private astronaut missions are crucial steps in learning how the relationships between government and private industry can grow and change. The International Space Station is really an amazing engineering achievement. In the last 21 years, there's been permanent human presence in space. We've slowly progressed from capsules and vehicles that visited for a short time to places like Skylab, where we ultimately did a 90-day mission back in the 70s. Now we're on ISS for a year or more. And now it's time for the next space station. Axiom Space is about making living and working in space commonplace. 
The government has forecasted a demand for flying NASA crew members to low Earth orbit to conduct basic research and further to their goals of deep space exploration. But then we also want to expand what can be done in space. 15 years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to be surrounded by objects that we can't live without that were manufactured in space. Today, we are in the process of building our first two elements. We have subsystems in development. We have a full lab of life support hardware that we're putting through its paces. We are building a propulsion system. It's a lot of those details in developing a space station. You know, the first two modules are being built by our partner, Talasalania, and we're heading to what is called CDR, which is a critical design review. That really means that 90% of the design is done, and then you're ready to go to manufacturing. So HAB-1 is that first module. It has four crew quarters, it has payload accommodations, and it has all of the systems uh, wired to keep crew healthy and alive. So the plan is we'll fly four separate modules to the ISS. When we arrive with the fourth module, it'll have what we need to be independent of the ISS. So a lot of thought went into how do we allow it to grow. When we look at the future, we have thoughts on how we could double the number of crew every five years. There's a lot of excitement here about the AX-1 mission. Everyone understands that it's a very historic mission. We are just so excited to be part of that and having our people enable this historic moment. The AX-1 mission provides us the opportunity to refine our flight techniques and operations concepts in order to meet the higher complexity of operating a space station in orbit. That moment where we're captured and birthed to the International Space Station will be a moment that defines how we move forward uh, as a species in low Earth orbit. This will be really the first time a fully commercial element has uh, been part of the complex. Axiom Station is going to allow humanity to be a multi-planet species. If we pull that off, we change the world. And speaking of growing and expanding opportunities in low Earth orbit, this Axiom mission adds to a story that began in 2003. In Israel, Eitan Stiba is not just becoming the second Israeli astronaut in the country's history, but he is following on the legacy of Ilan Ramon. For Israel, this is a mission of peace and hope, and they have called this mission Rakia, which is a word that means the heavens or firmament in English. So to tell us a little bit more about the Rakia mission, we send you now to our good friends in Tel Aviv, Israel, who are actively monitoring today's launch efforts. Thank you, John and Kate, and thank you for joining us here at the Rakia headquarters in Tel Aviv. I'm Omri Daron, and together with me is the Israeli team of Rakia and its partners who have worked day and night to make this mission possible. Now, all join together for this exciting launch of AX-1 to the International Space Station. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis are watching us from their homes. In Israel, we're at a very exciting moment. For the first time in 19 years and for only the second time in our nation's history, one of our own will be in space again, Israeli astronaut Eitan Stiba. Eitan is dedicating his journey to the Rakia mission. And what that means is that his time in space will be devoted to fulfilling the innovative ideas and creative dreams that were chosen by the people of Israel for Rakia. Every part of this Rakia mission has been developed in Israel with the goal to be impactful and innovative. For an Israeli child, this will be the first time to hear Hebrew lessons and demonstrations on the ISS. For Israeli scientists, artists, and educators, this will be a rare opportunity to perform their works in the unique microgravity environment with a home-trained astronaut. This will contribute greatly to international and Israeli research industries. Now, during the next 10 days, thousands will visit this venue and get to know the story of Rakia and AX-1. Here, our Rakia Mission Control Center will provide a unique opportunity for visitors to see behind the scenes of human space flight throughout Eitan Stiba's Rakia mission. It is our hope that those who follow Eitan on his journey understand that the Rakia mission promotes professional collaborations and manifests values of peace, innovation, social responsibility, and sustainability. It strives to connect the people of Israel and the world to these values and inspire dreams of possibility because no dream is beyond reach. Now, as we close from Tel Aviv, I'd like to present a short movie that will further highlight the significant efforts of the Rakia mission.
Just in case you find yourself leading an inspiring mission to space, here's a packing list that might help. You start with the basics. Ever-expanding dreams. Respect for borders mixed with utter disregard for them. Dozens of wishes. A poem. Your favorite soundtrack. Your biggest hopes. A hunger for miracles. Endless amounts of innovations, like brainwave measuring device, groundbreaking blood tests through capillaries, and laughing in the face of lenses manufacturing capabilities. A new outlook on storms. An entire platform that pushes science forward. Because there is no I in space. Dreams to be realized. Tips from friends who showed you the way. Two ounces of inspiration. Your inner child. Because the one thing that's more important than to travel light is to make sure travel enlightens an entire generation. Thousands of schools that joined the mission your nation's brightest, young, inquisitive minds. A sense of humor. A prayer, just in case. A few words of wisdom. 306,757, to be exact. And another four, to be exact. Amazing partners, local and foreign. And a big thank you to those who made it possible or just a big. Just over 63 minutes away from launch. Everything continues to go well out at Pad 39A for the XEM-1 mission flight to the International Space Station. Right now, Falcon 9 team is in the middle of the fuel bleed through the Merlin engines. That's going well. We've also done checkouts on the first and second stages. We're doing some final data checks. That's also looking good. Up on the Dragon capsule, you can see the crew access arm. The seal from the white room has actually been deflated. You can see it's pulled away a little bit. We're getting ready for the uh, advanced team to leave the pad at about T minus one hour. So they're on track right now to close out. We did have a good side leak, side hatch leak check. And so we're doing just the very last steps to uh, get the capsule ready for flight and then leave the pad. And of course, in the background, as you can see on the monitors or on your screens, it's blue skies over Kennedy Space Center, Pad 39A. Weather's looking good, both in the local area, as well as when we head northeast towards the space station, the ascent trajectory looks good. So at T minus one hour and two minutes, all systems are go. All right, well, you're looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft that is in the final stages of preparation to launch the world's first all-private astronaut mission to the International Space Station in just over one hour from now. 
Today's launch marks the next step in evolution of the human spaceflight story. This is the first of a number of planned private astronaut missions, or PAMs, by Axiom Space to the International Space Station, and it represents the culmination of years of hard work between both government and private entities to open up the doors to low Earth orbit. My name is John Rackham, and I am the Crew Systems Deputy Manager at Axiom Space, based Current out of Houston, Texas. Texas. Awareness, we are cycling orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure. All right, just some back and forth there between the crew uh, and the core. Uh, my name is Kate Tice. I'm the Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Uh, with our coverage now expanding to NASA television, I'd like to welcome friend from NASA, Dan Hewitt, uh, coming to us from Johnson Space Center over at Houston, Texas. Hey, Dan. Hey, Kate, great to see you and the Johns. We're excited to join and get this milestone mission off the ground. <laughs> Liftoff time is still holding, uh, let's see, for 11.17 a.m. Eastern time uh, and currently tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon. Uh, the range remains green, and as you can see there with that shot, the weather is definitely cooperating. Yeah, it's a beautiful day for launch. <laughs> what, a, what a gorgeous <laughs> shot. Now, over the last three hours, Axiom astronauts Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Mark Pathy, and Aton Stiba donned their SpaceX suits in our new suit up room uh, and were then transported to the pad where our crew entered the SpaceX Dragon, Dragon spacecraft that you see there live on your screen. Right, and since arriving at the spacecraft, our crews were helped by the closeout engineers or advanced team to get into their seats, attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air and a communication link to Dragon Systems. And at that point, they conducted successful leak checks and communication checks with the core here in Hawthorne, which is the person dedicated to speaking directly to the crew throughout the mission. The closeout team then sealed the hatch, uh, which also gets its own leak check. Um, unfortunately, that leak check didn't pass the first time, right. so we opened it back up, wiped it down, and performed that leak check again. Uh, and that second one was good. good so one. that leak check is closed. Or excuse me, that side hatch is now closed. Uh, moments from now, the closeout team will depart the pad uh, while weather operators kick off their final check on wind speeds at the pad uh, before the final go, no-go for launch. But before we get to that final go, no-go, uh, the SpaceX team will do an internal poll, making sure conditions are ready with Falcon 9, Dragon, the crew, the range, and the weather. Uh, let's pause now and watch uh, with that, uh, watch the closeout crew as they uh, finalize their preparations there on the pad. As you can see, the crew there on the right-hand side of your screen continuing to wait another 57 minutes <laughs> until uh, we lift off from pad 39A, which you can see there on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, we can confirm that the closeout team has departed uh, the, the access arm there, um, so that's good news. Now, as the countdown continues, let's take a moment to get reacquainted with our crew today. So the AX-1 mission is commanded by retired NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria, a Spanish-American who was born in Madrid, Spain, and is also called Mission Viejo, California, as well as Boston, Massachusetts home. Michael is a U.S. Navy captain and has flown three times aboard the space shuttle and once aboard Soyuz, so he has quite a bit of flight pedigree. He has conducted 10 spacewalks in his career, accumulating 67 hours and 40 minutes total in the vacuum of space. Both of these landmarks are NASA records. In 2021, he was inducted into the, NAS, into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. Um, you might hear us call him L MLA a few times around here, so if you like acronyms, uh, here's a new one for you. <laughs> the pilot for AX-1 is Larry Connor from Dayton, Ohio. Larry is an entrepreneur, nonprofit activist, investor. 
He's won, uh, excuse me, he's won aerobatic flying competitions and has summited both Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Rainier. Through AX-1, he'll become the first private pilot to reach the ISS. He'll also become the first human to reach Dragon both... SpaceX, you are go for section six of four decimal 100. When ready, report go for launch. That's in work, SpaceX. All right, so just some uh, back and forth with SpaceX core Arthur Berrialt and the crew um, continuing to work through our procedures. Um, ultimately, next check will be to make sure that the crew inside Dragon Endeavor are go for launch. Yeah. Uh, back to our pilot, Larry Connor. Um, as I said, he, uh, he will also become the first human to reach both the deepest ocean depths and enter the bounds of outer space within one year. That's that's just crazy to me. <laughs> Larry has been actively involved with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic for many years, helping to understand the effects of aging. This mission will add a new dimension. Go for launch. Copy that endeavor. Crews go for launch. All right. So that is yeah. fantastic news. Um, that's basically four thumbs up inside yeah. <laughs> uh, Crew Dragon right now. Um, yeah, so really good news there. Yeah. So continuing out our crew, moving on to Mission Specialist 1. Eitan Stiba will become the second Israeli ever to fly to space. In many ways, today's mission is a return to flight for the nation of Israel after the Columbia tragedy in 2003. Aton served for more than four decades as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force, where he received the Distinguished Aviator Medal, and today he is an impact investor and philanthropist. In collaboration with the Ramon Foundation, the Israel Space Agency, and the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology, and the Ministry of Education, Stiebel will fly to the ISS under the Rakia banner and the maxim, there is no dream beyond reach. During his time on the ISS, Stibble will facilitate scientific experiments, educational outreach, and one of my personal favorites, artistic activities. Mark Pathy is an entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist, as well as mission specialist number two on this AX-1 mission. Pathy is currently the chief executive officer and chairman of Montreal-based Maverick, a privately owned investment and financing company he founded that focuses on innovation and social impact. As a strong believer in the importance of philanthropy, Pathy is a member of the boards and executive committees of the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, Dons LaRue, and the Pathy Family Foundation. Through the AX-1 mission, Pathy will become Canada's second private, uh, private astronaut and the 12th Canadian to go to space. All right, well, you've seen the vehicle, you've met the crew, you've heard some good calls on our way to launch, and we're just within the hour. So let's send you over now to NASA's Johnson Space Center, where Dan Hewitt is following the launch prep from Mission Control in Houston. Dan, over to you. Hey, thanks, John. And the team behind me flying the space station, the crew on board, they're ready to get this first private astronaut mission off the ground. Back in 2019, NASA took steps to open the station up for business, issuing a directive to enable new commercial activity on board, including private astronaut missions. And all of this is done with the goal of building a robust economy in low Earth orbit. Now, why does NASA want to do that? Well, we're very aware that there is untapped potential in that space just outside of our atmosphere, and low Earth orbit can be a first step towards unlocking limitless possibilities. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Greatness. Whew, boy. <laughs> Cannot always be seized in a moment. Sometimes it requires a first step, a step into the unknown. Not knowing the path, but understanding the goal. Believing that the first step leads to greatness. We've touched the sky. Believing it will lead to new worlds. We've left our home. Believing in a brighter future. We've come together, believing in shared goals. We've stayed and learned, believing in benefits for all. We take the first step time and time again, because we've witnessed its benefits. 
and believe in its potential. So we're expanding and enabling this step for others to push humanity further as we prepare for the next giant leap. We'll always need this first step. We're here to stay. And now is the time to join us. And lower Earth orbit is that first step. And for NASA, we're in it for the long haul. For the last more than 20 years, we've shown that you can get incredible value from doing research and technology demonstrations in low Earth orbit on the station. And along the way, we've continually increased our work with commercial organizations, flying research, payloads, entire facilities, experiments. Uh, and working with U.S. companies to fly cargo and crew to the station, the latter of those laying the groundwork for the mission we're seeing about to launch today. Uh, and we're continuing to look ahead onto the horizon, working with companies like Axiom and others to get a jump start on developing new destinations in low Earth orbit where future astronauts and not just those from NASA will be able to go and explore and do research just outside of our atmosphere. So we've got our sights on the horizon and our ultimate goal is for NASA to become one of many customers in this new economy in low Earth orbit as we set our sights on deep space exploration uh, heading back to the moon and beyond under the Artemis program. Now, the AX-1 mission is a good example of the public and private partnerships that are going to make that future vision a reality. But to take a little bit deeper of a dive, let's jump over now to my colleague, Megan Cruz, who's standing by at Kennedy Space Center with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Over to you, Megan. Good morning to you, Dan, and good morning, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Great to have you here, as always. Good morning. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk to you because we know that one of NASA's goals has been to enable commercial efforts in space. With today's Axiom-1 mission, the first all-private crew to the International Space Station, what does today represent for the agency? We're taking commercial business off the face of the Earth and putting it up in space. And that's one of our main uh, programs now because we want to get NASA out of low Earth orbit and go explore the heavens. Uh, we want to direct our energy and our resources to do that because we're going back to the moon and we're going to Mars. And uh, so uh, we want, for example, we're going to continue the space station for another eight years. Yep. Uh, we want to have commercial space stations. NASA wants to become uh, the ability to lease uh, uh, space on a commercial space station instead of having the responsibility of the space station. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that because I know that we've seen success with commercial cargo missions, commercial crew missions. Are commercial stations next? Uh, indeed. Well, that's what we're doing today. We are bringing a commercial company to our ISS. We are then going to have them attach a commercial module to the International Space Station. And then we're encouraging the building. We've got uh, uh, initiatives out there in private industry right now uh, to build a commercial space station. And then all of our international partners on the space station, we're taking with us out into, for example, lunar orbit. The Gateway, which is like a space station in lunar orbit, is uh, going to be a number of nations uh, landing on the moon. We're going to have other uh, nations participate as well. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of partnerships going forward with NASA to accomplish some of the big goals that we have. Well, as it should be, because our program is internationally, and when we go to Mars, uh, there's going to be a delegation from planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Are you excited for today's launch? Oh, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Administrator. I really appreciate you being here, and I hope you enjoyed today's launch. Thanks a lot. All right, back to you guys at Hawthorne. We're at T-minus 46 minutes, 10 seconds. We've just heard from the SpaceX launch director. Brief the CE or LD, and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. 
Launch Control will abort the launch auto sequence and immediately proceed into launch abort. At T minus 10 seconds, Launch Control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. For those operators in firing up four, in the event of a fire alarm, key operators noted in 57.83 will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personnel safety is threatened, evacuate to the south facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. Firing up four and MCCX will go into a sterile cockpit and lock down for the duration of the time the launch escape system is armed. Launch control at this time, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. With that, arming crew arm for, crew arm for movement. T minus 45 minutes and counting. You've just heard the SpaceX launch director give the final execution instructions to the launch crew team. Access arm retraction started. We're ready for propellant load. That'll begin in about 10 minutes. Before that, we've got crew access arm to retract happening now, and then arming of the launch escape system. Everything continues to look good for an on-time launch of Falcon 9 with Axiom-1 mission. Dragon SpaceX for tablets. As we prepare to step into LES arming, uh, I need you to verify that the elastic bands are over the corners of all of the iPads in the vehicle. I just stand by. SpaceX Endeavor, Arthur, I can confirm that the elastic bands on the satchels are around the tablet. All right, copy that. Thank you, MLA. And for awareness, that last call came in pretty quiet, so if you could speak up on the upcoming calls, that'd be great. Thanks. Well, Okay, we'll give you an update here inside of 43 minutes. Crew access arm has retracted from the Dragon spacecraft. Next up, we've got launch escape system arming. And then at T minus 45 minutes, or T minus 35 minutes, we'll begin loading propellant onto the Falcon 9. So right now, Falcon 9s go, Dragons go, weather looks good, and the range areas are also cleared for launch. So Kate, John, everything is looking good. Inside of 42 minutes, everything continues to go well. Waiting now for a launch escape system arming. Endeavour SpaceX for launch escape system. Go ahead, Arthur. All right, MLA, at this time I can give you a go to step through section seven of 4.100, close visors and arm the launch escape system. That should work.
This X Endeavor, visors are closed. We are arming the launch escape system. Dragon, SpaceX, launch escape system is verified armed. Copy, SpaceX. All right, there you heard it. The launch escape system is now armed. You can see there the crew in their seats with the visors down. Uh, launch escape system, um, you know, is the first of its kind escape system. Um, it provides escape capability all the way to orbit. It's a really uh, important function to have. Um, obviously, no intention of using it today, mm -hmm. um, but that's what those callouts were there um, back and forth that we just heard. Right, and as you heard earlier too from Administrator Bill Nelson, um, you know, the importance of low Earth orbit. So speaking of just how valuable low Earth orbit is, the crew of X-1 will be conducting a tremendous amount of science over the course of their eight days on board the ISS. And not only does that include 25 Axiom managed studies, but it also includes the Axiom crew participating in efforts that extend far beyond this mission. Some of those we actually looked at earlier. One of these broader studies is a series of health monitoring tests before and after the flight. A few days ago, I was able to connect with Dr. Emmanuel Riquetta to talk about the ongoing research this crew will participate in on behalf of the Translation Research Institute for Space Health, also known as TRISH. Here's our conversation. Dr. Riquetta, welcome. It is wonderful to get to talk to you. Uh, please introduce yourself and tell us, what is TRISH? Absolutely. My name is Emmanuel Riquetta, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. And I'm also faculty at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. The Translational Research Institute for Space Health, or TRISH, uh, we're partners to the Human uh, Research Program at NASA. And one of our main goals is to find and fund new disruptive research that is high risk but potentially high reward, uh, with the end goal of keep uh, humans healthy both in space and on Earth. And we have been working with commercial spaceflight missions uh, since last year, and Axiom 1 is our fourth commercial spaceflight mission. That's really fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit more about your primary areas of focus or what you're studying on this mission? Yeah, so Trish uh, focuses mainly on the high priority areas uh, of, of human um, space-like research. And um, I would say the three highest priority areas are radiation, um, behavioral uh, issues that come from being isolated and confined in space. And the third one is how your body changes uh, while well, you're in a different uh, gravity field, either a, a zero G environment like in space or during different gravity fields uh, when you are uh, in, in the moon or Mars. Okay, interesting. So what kind of systems or hardware are you working with specifically to capture this data? For this mission, the hardware that we're using is uh, absolutely optimized uh, to provide number one, the, the highest quality data, while uh, you know being still easy to use, easy to implement, uh, and being the lowest burden to, to, the, um, uh, to the astronauts. So to collect all of these data, for example, uh, vision changes, we have been using a, a small device is uh, roughly the size of a shoebox that you can see here, have this here with me. So this is basically like having uh, an optometrist uh, on a box. Basically, the only thing that you have to do is just, just grab it, uh, put it on your eyes, uh, look uh, at an object that is roughly six feet away from you. And after a few seconds, you get uh, a prescription of, of your glasses as right here. So as I was saying, um, if, if there's any changes on, on astronauts during these missions, we'll be able to see how the changes with this device. 
Uh, we're also looking, I was mentioning, at behavioral changes, how uh, being in, in, in an isolated and confined environment has any behavioral aspects. And for this one, we have been using a, a small tablet like this one, also to test the sensory motor adaptation, the, the balance disorders and the space motion sickness, uh, we're using a device like this. And for each of the, of the crew members, we have a set of hardware like this, and um, uh, it fits, uh, the, the four sets of hardware fits on a, on a medium-sized um, suitcase. So it is, it is really easy to move uh, wherever it needs to go uh, for, for launch and, uh, and landing. That's wonderful. So what are some of the intended outcomes or goals of the research you're doing? Yeah, so some of the outcomes uh, and one of the main applications, um, number one for spaceflight that, that, that we want to get from, from this research, is that short duration missions like uh, Axiom-1 are very, very relevant in the context of Artemis missions. When we go back to the moon, the first missions are gonna be roughly the same duration as, as Axiom 1. So anything new that we learn from these missions is gonna be absolutely valuable. Really, every new piece of data that we collect in spaceflight could potentially solve and be that, that uh, last piece of the puzzle that we're looking to, to complete uh, what we need to know. Well, Dr. Riketa, thank you so much for speaking with us today. We wish you the best of luck. It is my pleasure, thank you. All right, we are about 30 minutes out from launch of the historic AX-1 mission. It has taken an enormous effort from an incredibly dedicated and hardworking team to get to this moment. And that team wanted to take an opportunity to wish the crew of AX-1 well and Godspeed. Hey, AX-1, we're so happy for you guys. And just want to let you know we've got you here on the ground in mission control, so fly high and have some fun. From all of us here at the Integrated Performance Team, we want to wish you luck on your pioneering mission to the ISS and hope to see you in a couple years when AXH1 launches. It is not only an immense honor to get to watch your monumental mission, but also to have been able to support you on your journey towards this day as well. Hey guys, can't wait for this mission. We put a lot of hard work in. We're excited for you all to uh, have a great time up there and good luck. Thank you for helping set an important precedence ahead of a very bright future. Good luck, AX-1 crew. Let's conquer space. Hasta pronto. We want to send you all off with good wishes in this incredible journey. Godspeed. It has been such an honor to watch and support you guys as you prepare for this moment. I am so proud of each one of you for the dedication, the long hours, and the hard work you've put into making this a meaningful mission. Hello, Axiom astronauts. Thanks for stepping up to the plate for this amazing journey. You guys have trained hard. You've waited a long time and this is now happening. Safe travels on this historic mission for the first private astronauts to go to the ISS. It's happening. Wave to us from up above because we'll be thinking of you from down below. We're the Axiom Safety Team. We just want you to know that we are really proud of you and we've got your back. We're wishing you a safe and successful mission and we'll see you when you get back on the ground. Hi guys, we're the Axiom Soft Goods team and we just want to wish you a good mission and get back safely. It's a real pleasure to be talking with you guys right now and we're super excited for you. I'm here to cheer you on along with the entire crew systems team. Yay. Yay. Thanks for everything you're doing. I wish you all the very best, the greatest of success, and the most fun and the most challenging, interesting thing in your life. Go big and enjoy your time on the ISS. We'll see you back on the ground. Hey guys, I am so proud of the Axiom One crew. It's so fun to be a part of something bigger than you and to contribute. Most important thing to remember guys, take some time to look out the window and appreciate where you are. It's space. We're T minus 31 minutes and 40 seconds, counting down to the first all private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. A few minutes ago, Falcon 9 propellant loading began on time at T minus 35 minutes. RP 1 fuel loading is underway on both the first and second stages. Liquid oxygen loading is underway on the first stage. Now we'll finish up fuel loading on the second stage at about T minus 20 minutes, doesn't take very long. And then we'll begin loading liquid oxygen on the second stage at about T minus 16 and a half minutes. We'll continue propellant loading on Falcon 9 up until about T minus two minutes. 
Now, speaking of propellants, the Dragon spacecraft was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road from the launch site at what we call Dragonland. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer. Start of stage one, cryohelium loading. For the fuel, we use monomethyl hydrazine, or MMH, and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for oxidizer. Now together, these propellants feed the Draco engines that will maneuver Dragon on orbit, changing its attitude, uh, raising its orbit to get to the space station. But that propellant also serves a second purpose, and that would be to use in the eight Super Draco engines that would power the launch escape system in an escape scenario. But right now on pad 39A, nice view of Falcon 9 with Dragon there, you can see the crew axis arm has retracted away from the Dragon spacecraft. The four-person crew is inside Dragon right now. The launch escape system is armed. The propellant is going into the Falcon 9. So since we are at this stage with launch escape system arm, that means the eight Super Draco engines inside the Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to launch the capsule away from the Falcon 9 rocket in an instant, should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. We have the ability to use a launch escape system right now if it was needed. A couple other status items. Weather, as you can see, looks good. Probability of violating the launch commit criteria is less than 10%. The only thing we're watching is wind gusts, but we believe, having seen the, the wind for the last several hours, everything continues to look good. That should not be an issue. Weather is also good in the Atlantic Ocean should we need to use a launch escape splashdown site for the Dragon capsule. We've also got upper altitude winds we've been checking out. Uh, balloons have been released by the range here recently. We continue to look good for upper altitudes as Falcon 9 through, flies through the periods of max, maximum dynamic pressure. And finally, on the range, of course, we have cleared the danger areas, the hazard, the caution areas. Everybody's out of there except the four-person crew up in the Dragon capsule, very top of the rocket you can see in the picture. So coming up, T-minus 28 minutes, 30 seconds, everything continuing to look good on Falcon 9 with Dragon for the Axiom-1 mission. Let's take a moment now to get acquainted with the vehicles that you see there on your screen. That's a live view of Falcon 9 with Dragon, uh, our spacecraft on top. Falcon 9 rocket is a rocket, um, excuse me, Falcon 9 rocket with a Dragon spacecraft on top. Uh, together stands about 215 feet, which is almost 30 feet taller than the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy, <laughs> which is 130, uh, 183 feet. Um, Falcon 9 is a reusable two-stage liquid-fueled rocket, uh, which means that it's kind of like two rockets in one, the first stage and the second stage. Very cool. So I'm talking a bit about that first stage. The first stage is the bottom two-thirds of the vehicle that you see there. It has that nice patina. It's been reused a, a little bit. Um, it's covered in soot from a previous mission. That first stage is responsible for accelerating Falcon and Dragon through the Earth's atmosphere and into space. To do that, it has nine Merlin engines at the bottom of that first stage. Prior to liftoff, the Falcon 9 first stage is loaded up with nearly 1 million pounds of fuel and liquid oxygen, and the Merlin engines on the first stage are optimized for sea level. Uh, these achieve 190,000 pounds of thrust during ascent and descent. The first stage accelerates the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere into space and then separates the rest of the rocket at about two and a half minutes into flight. From there, the first stage will do what no other orbital class rocket in the world can do. It'll make its way back to Earth and target a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, which you see there on your screen. The seas look great, the blue skies, I, I don't think it could be any more picture perfect. No, it's like a desktop <laughs> right there, I think. Uh, our drone ships are essentially autonomous, powered spaceports that allow our rocket to land over the ocean. Uh, for reference, our drone ships are equivalent to the size of a football field. So uh, while it may have looked kind of small on your screen, they're actually pretty ginormous in real life. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be to hold a rocket, right? Mm -hmm. um, as, man as mentioned previously, Falcon 9 is a two-stage rocket, it's two rockets in one. Above the first stage is the second stage. Now, the second stage has a single Merlin vacuum, or MVAC, engine, which ignites after the Started. first stage. Separates. 
Now the second stage is essentially a smaller version of the first stage, and whereas the first stage is designed to power the vehicle out of Earth's atmosphere in the forces of gravity, the second stage is specifically designed to operate in the vacuum of space. The second stage powers the Dragon spacecraft to its specific, specific targeted drop-off point in orbit. The Dragon spacecraft is capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond, uh, but for today's mission, it is carrying four members of the Axiom-1 crew. It is the first private spacecraft to take humans to the space station and the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth. Like the Falcon 9 rocket, uh, the Dragon spacecraft is also reusable. Today will be the third flight to space uh, for this Dragon spacecraft uh, that the Axiom-1 crew is flying in today. Uh, the previous flights for this th this capsule supported were uh, recently the Crew-2 mission and before that the Demo-2 mission, uh, which was our first human spaceflight mission. Pretty incredible. Yeah. Now, as we await T0 in just under 25 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. Let's take a look at what the ascent portion of this mission will look like. Right, so once we hit T-0, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. It's worth noting that once we hit max Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that happen in rapid succession. The first of which is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which, as the name suggests, that is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth for landing as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event. Right, now SES-1, or second engine start one, is where the Merlin vacuum engine lights up and propels the second stage, along with our AX-1 crew, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back to Earth. The first stage is the entry burn, where three of the Merlin 1D engines will reignite and then shut down. This helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into Earth's atmosphere. While the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its singular Merlin engine and that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for confirmation of good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn, which is a single engine burn, will bring the vehicle's speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship uh, at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. And while Falcon 9's first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. And once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. And lastly, the nose cone deploy sequence will initiate just before T plus 12 minutes and finish around T plus 15 minutes. Uh, and this sequence will expose Dragon's docking mechanism in advance of its arrival at the International Space Station. So, uh, as you can tell, it's, it's a pretty jam-packed 12 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention. Pay close attention to what you're listening to. Don't blink. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with all of that in mind, uh, let's head back over to Dan Hewitt for an update uh, from the ISS team over at Johnson Space Center. Dan? Hey, thanks, Kate. Now, inside the room, the International Space Station Flight Control Room, Flight Director Scott Stover is leading the teams right now. But just about four hours ago, NASA Flight Director Diane Daly gave a go on behalf of the combined ISS team to the SpaceX uh, Mission Director, just saying that ISS, or the space station, was go for launch. Now, to get there, we've got a list of flight rules, basically just guidelines for all of the major systems we have to make sure are functioning on board station before we can give a go to launch another 
crew up there. So we're looking at everything from those core critical command and control computers, verifying we have a good communication path through our tracking and data relay satellites, uh, ensuring that the atmosphere, all of the life support systems on board are functioning, even the mechanical systems like the docking port where this mission is headed. So. We're expecting today's flight to be about a 20 and a half hour journey from launch to docking uh, with the Crew Dragon Endeavor headed towards the Node 2 Zenith, that's the space facing port on the top uh, of Node 2, the Harmony module on board the station. And once they get there, they're gonna get welcomed by the Expedition 67 crew, which is made up of seven individuals right now, four from our SpaceX through Crew 3 mission with three NASA astronauts and one ESA European astronaut. Uh, and they're joined by three three cosmonauts that just arrived on station uh, about two weeks ago. Now, so it's going to take them about 20 and a half hours to get there. That docking right now is targeted for 11.45 GMT on Saturday. That's 6.45 AM here in Houston, 4.45 for the teams over in Hawthorne. And so once they get there, they'll be able to get out of their suits uh, on board the Dragon spacecraft uh, while the team on board station moves into what's known as uh, uh, the hatch operations, uh, Station Commander Tom Marshall is going to be pressurizing that small area between Dragon uh, and the station hatches. And we expect it to be a little under two hours from docking to hatch open, and then we'll welcome the AX-1 crew on board the space station. So a lot to come with that 20 and a half hour journey, but all that's going to start with a launch. So I'll send it back over to Hawthorne as we get into the final phases of the countdown. Back over to you, John. Right. Well, Dan, as you mentioned, it all starts with the launch. And Kate, it's looking like it's getting pretty busy here. People are excited about seeing a launch, right? Yeah. We're just now under 20 minutes until liftoff. Um, as you could probably tell by the, the noise, uh, the crew here, excuse me, the, the, the crowd here in Hawthorne, uh, we're at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, um, is starting to gather uh, just beyond mission control here uh, in the building. And uh, you might be able to tell by the ambient noise. Yeah. Uh, in addition to the live production noises that you also hear. You know, we are in a rocket factory. Um, but yeah, you can see there the crowd is starting to grow behind the mission, the team there at Hawthorne Mission Control. Now we saw Dan speaking earlier from uh, Mission Control in Johnson. There is a Mission Control Center uh, in Florida where the SpaceX teams are also gathered um, in firing room four. And then we have the, the launch, or excuse me, the Mission Control Center here. Uh, there's a, a shot of our firing room four there in Florida at Cape Canaveral. You can just uh, barely make out pad 39A there in the distance there through the window. Um, might be wondering why all the different mission control rooms. Uh, mm -hmm. The one in Johnson, uh, as Dan was saying, you know, that's really mission control for the International Space Station and those operations. The control room that you see there is for everything leading up to launch. Um, as soon as Falcon 9 lifts off, uh, responsibility and control transfers to Mission Control Center here in Hawthorne. Uh, so just a Quick explanation for why right. why so many rooms with computers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and in addition to all the teams gathering here, we've got teams of our own gathering in Houston at Axiom headquarters. You can see there on your screen Axiom Mission Control with uh, the lovely Axiom family behind them looking in proudly. All right, well, you know, Dan mentioned that, you know, first we have launch, then we got rendezvous and docking, and then we've got eight days of jam-packed activity on the ISS. So busy. <laughs> yeah, and, and docking day is not, it's not just a ride to space, right? You, you get up there, you open that hatch, and crew is working. I got a little chance to look at some of their timeline, um, and as soon as they open that door, they are getting invited in, they are getting trained on some uh, emergency procedures, and then stepping right into payload activity, stowage transfers, um, and just generally getting acclimated, but they're working before they go to sleep and the work doesn't stop there. <laughs> um, it sounds a lot like everything leading up to launch itself, you know, everything is scheduled, mm -hmm. planned, um, even, you know, we know that even sleep time is scheduled yeah. on the ISS. Um, it's something that's uh, incredible to me is that not only do you have work to do, where, you know, your science experiments and that kind of stuff, not only do you have to get some sleep. <laughs> or you can. Um, you also have to exercise, right? Yeah. The exercise time, uh, which can be a couple hours. Stage two, Luxo to start it. 
All right, so good news there. We have begun LOX load, uh, liquid oxygen loading on second stage. Uh, so that is currently underway for first and second stage, as well as loading of RP1, uh, which is our fuel on both first and second stages. Right. Right, and again, you know, some of those things that he talked about, it's all following a timeline, right? And we are listening to, for those important cues along the way that we're hearing on these nets or on the loops, um, uh, listening for where are we along in that timeline so we know exactly where we are in terms for launch as we count down at just T minus 15 from launch. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking uh, at my dashboard here. It looks like fuel load on second stage is now complete. Uh, so we're re beginning that LOX load as we just heard. Um, LOX load and fuel load continues on uh, first stage. Axiom crew continuing to wait, yeah. <laughs> following along with everything happening there uh, with the touchscreen uh, displays there above them, as well as their tablets strapped to their legs. Right. Everything continuing to look nominal for liftoff in just about 15 minutes. And as we approach uh, that liftoff, in these final moments of our countdown to launch, Axiom Space founders Cam Gaffari and Mike Safferdini wanted to take a moment to reflect on this mission. Well, this moment for me and Michael is a very special moment uh, in a beginning of many beginnings, right? The launch of AX-1 uh, going to International Space Station as part of our journey to build the first private commercial space station. And we're so grateful to be here and delighted uh, at this moment as part of this incredible journey to commercialize and privatize low Earth orbit. On behalf of Cam and I, we'd like to thank the entire team that's made this historic journey possible. The SpaceX team in particular has done a tremendous job of prepping our crew for a launch on their transportation vehicle. The crew itself has done a fantastic job of getting themselves ready and planning their research. NASA, of course, we can't do this without uh, NASA's leadership and support. And to each of you in the Axiom Space family, we couldn't have done it without you. We're looking forward to a bright future together. T minus 14 minutes, seven seconds, and continuing to count down. Everything is still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon. That'll occur 17 minutes and 12 seconds after the hour. As a recap, Falcon 9 began propellant loading at T minus 35 minutes. We just heard loading of the RP-1 fuel, the kerosene fuel on stage two was completed right on time at T minus 20 minutes. We've still got fuel going on to the first stage. Looks like we're about 90% or so full right now. Fuel loading will finish up at T minus six minutes and we'll hear that call out in the countdown. Meanwhile, densified liquid oxygen is continuing to load onto both the first and second stages. First stage will close out at T minus three minutes. The second stage, we just began loading liquid oxygen at T minus 16 and a half minutes just a few minutes ago. That'll wrap up at the T-minus two-minute mark. Now we load the liquid oxygen as late as we can in the countdown. It's densified, that means it's ultra cold, well below the boiling point of liquid oxygen. That lets us put as much as we can on the vehicle for performance, and getting it on board the vehicle just before liftoff means it won't warm up, where you start to lose uh, the ability to put liquid oxygen onto the stages, into the tank. Uh, in the quantities we want. So it stays nice and cold, it doesn't bleed off, and that gives us the performance we need on Falcon 9. Continuing on, Falcon 9 checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, what we call TVC wiggles, you may hear that term, they're coming up. We're also going to be doing throttle valve checkouts on the Merlin engines. That helps control the power of the engines as we go through flight. For example, you hear a throttle down or throttle up as we prepare for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. As we come up on the 12 minute mark, the range continues to be go. Uh, roadblocks are up, all the hazard areas are clear. Airspace, sea space is good. The weather is go. Beautiful shots you can see here, blue skies. I'm looking forward to some great views from the cameras as we head into space. And then finally on the Dragon side, the Dragon mission director and team, they're reporting no issues. We've done the communication checkouts with the crew. You can see the crew access arm has retracted into the launch position. You can see Dragon now with the strong back of the transport director and the umbilicals going to Dragon alongside of it. 
We've also armed the launch escape system, and obviously the crew is strapped in the Dragon capsule and they're ready to go. Final instructions of the crew will come in about a minute and a half at T minus 10. We'll listen to that. The crew displays will be configured for launch, and that setup will give the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding, and it provides constant updates on vehicle health. The T minus five minutes will be in the terminal count for Dragon. Dragon will transition to internal power, going to its onboard batteries and off of the external ground power. We're gonna hear continued callouts on the countdown net as we go from T minus 10 to zero, and then as we fly after T zero and liftoff, we'll hear callouts as we head into space. And that'll be letting the crew know as they reach each of the milestones. Our next big event coming up at T minus 10 minutes is we're gonna do launch commit criteria and final instructions will be going to the crew. One other thing that you will hear is during ascent, you may hear one alpha, one bravo, two alpha. These are launch escape states. As the Falcon 9 flies, if a launch escape was required, the crew on board knows where they are passing various points in the countdown, and that would tell Dragon what sequence of events to execute to come off of the Falcon 9 and bring the crew back safely down under the parachutes in the ocean. Right now, T minus 10 minutes, let's listen in to the countdown now. Dragon, SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Endeavor, we confirm they're configured. Copy MLA, and on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, we're honored to have you aboard Endeavor for its third flight to the International Space Station. Axiom 1 marks a new step in commercial space flight and research. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. Thanks for those words, Arthur. I've got a few of my own. I'm going to let my crewmate Aton say it first, though. Shalom. כמה ימים לפני שאנחנו מציינים את המסע הגדול שלנו לחירות and a few minutes before launching on this journey I wish to share with you the words of the Greek poet Constantine Kavafi that well describe the perspective of, of our marvelous crew Keep Ithaca always in your mind Arriving there is what you are destined for but do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. To you, so you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you have gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you this marvelous journey. Thank you, Eitan. I'm going to continue far less elegantly or eloquently, but uh, as we sit here on the precipice of this new era in human spaceflight, we do so on the shoulders of professionals at SpaceX, NASA, and Axiom. We um, want to thank all the teams at SpaceX, uh, Falcon 9, Dragon, the launch team, of course, closeout team, uh, all of the folks in mission control, um, and of course, our training teams. With NASA, boy, it's been tough, you know, the first time is always hard, and there's no playbook, it's all open field running, but with ISS program, commercial video development, and flight operations, we've learned a lot, and we'll continue to do so. We want to thank Cam and Seth for their vision, but especially all the people at Action for putting this mission together with the minor miracles that they perform. All of you, make no mistake, are the men and the women in the arena. Your faces are marred, if metaphorically, by the best sweat and blood, and you strive valiantly. You will have no place with the cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. The crew of the great ship Endeavor is ready to sail her proudly, Arthur. Some heartfelt words there. Stage one, engine chill has started. All right, so there was the call that uh, we have begun to chill the engines on uh, the first stage. So what we're doing right now is flowing a little bit of the super chilled liquid oxygen uh, through the turbo pumps 
on those M1D engines. There's nine of them at the base of the first stage. Uh, and that's essentially bringing them down to the temperature of that super chilled liquid oxygen to uh, prevent any thermal shock to the hardware. Uh, and just before that, call some really heartfelt words from yeah. Commander MLA uh, and Mission Specialist Aton Stiba. Um, really love hearing that commentary. Stage one, RP load is complete. At this point in time, the at this point in time, uh, fuel is fully loaded on both the first and second stage. Locks loading continues uh, on both stages. Coming up on five and a half minutes, Kate's let us know that we've got the fuel load complete. Next is coming up, we're T minus five minutes. Dragon will be transitioning uh, configuration for terminal count and going on its internal battery power. Everything continues to look good as we're counting down. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. Falcon 9 tanks are pressing for strong back retract. Heard the call out. We're pressurizing the tanks for strong back retract. We'll hear a sequence momentarily. Strong back is retracting. Actually, that's the start of about a one minute sequence. In about T minus four minutes, the clamp arms that you can see there will open. And then, the, and then we will see the retract from there. So we've heard the call out. That's the start of the sequence. Doesn't mean that the clamp arms uh, are late opening. It will take us a few more seconds. As you can hear, the excitement and the crowd is really growing oh, yeah. uh, here at SpaceX headquarters at Hawthorne, California. There you can see the clamp arms have begun to open. And next we should see the strong back uh, begin to retract. This structure is what we basically use to transport uh, the fully integrated vehicle to and from the hangar, uh, from the hangar to the launch pad. And there you can see that the strong back retraction has begun. Everything continued to look phenomenal uh, as we're now under three and a half minutes until launch. RP-1 fuel is fully loaded on first and second stage. Uh, should be wrapping up LOX load on uh, the first stage momentarily and continuing to fill on second stage. Stage one, lock load is complete. We're under three minutes until liftoff of the Axiom-1 mission. Dragon is the in terminal count and is on internal power. All right, there we heard that Dragon is on internal power. Um, as I was saying, we're getting close. The crowds are growing. The excitement is palpable. You can see there on the left-hand side of your screen, Mich Mission Control here in Hawthorne, California, just behind where John and I are. Um, and then on the right-hand side, that looks like Axiom Mission that Control. That looks like Axiom Mission Control in Houston, Texas. Everybody's waving and saying, hey. All right, at this point in time, that lock load on first stage is complete. So the first stage is now fully loaded with all of its propellant. Lock load on second stage continues. As we've mentioned before... Stage the... two, lock load is complete. All right, so there's that call. At this point in time, Falcon 9 Dragon is... Dragon is in auto idle. Dragon is fully loaded with all of its propellants, nearly 1 million pounds of that propellant. 
Next event coming up started. right now, venting. the gas closeouts. We finished pressurizing the storage tanks on board the Falcon 9. They gave the crew the heads up and they hear some loud venting noises. We're also going to vent down the liquid oxygen line that carried the locks up to the second stage. Generates a typical large white cloud of condensation around the strong back. Big event coming up now, T minus one minute, all the flight computers take over. Let's listen in to the last minute of terminal count. FTS is armed, Falcon 9 is in startup and now controlling. Dragon is in countdown. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX Endeavor, we acknowledge, go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 15 seconds. Chapter begins. Godspeed AX1. Stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 38 seconds into this historic mission, flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9. All right, telemetry nominal. Stage one, throttle down. Throttling down in the preparation for max dynamic pressure. Falcon 9 is supersonic. Next cue. Stage one, throttle up. Merlin 1D engines coming Stage back up to power. One Bravo. Copy, one Bravo. The crew calling out one Bravo should a escape situation arise. It tells the Dragon flight computer what profile to fly using the Super Draco engines. But everything is looking good on Falcon 9. We're getting nominal call outs from all the engineers and a great view from the ground camera and the onboard cameras. In back chill underway. Beginning to chill in the second stage turbo pump in preparation for its ignition coming up in just over half a minute from now. Coming up on about three and a half G's acceleration for the crew. We'll begin throttling down the Merlin engines to hold that, period, that level of acceleration. Next event coming up, we're gonna get main engine cutoff stage of the line engines. Down. Get stage separation and ignition of the second stage engine. You've heard the throttle down call out. We're holding three and a half G's for the crew. And Miko. Successful stage separation ignition of the second stage engine. On the left, the titanium grid fins beginning to slowly deploy. Great views from the first stage camera. The first stage now begins a slow flip maneuver. You can see the white uh, nitrogen gas plumes as we reorient for an entry back through the Earth's atmosphere a little bit later in the plus count. Second stage, we see the engine nozzle glowing red. 
Everything continuing to look good on the second stage. We should be hearing call outs coming up to the crew here shortly on how the trajectory is looking. What we like to hear. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. An AOS Bermuda acquisition of signal. The Bermuda tracking station now getting telemetry from the second stage of the Falcon 9 with the Dragon on top. T plus four minutes, 10 seconds. Everything continues to be nominal. First stage coasting to Apogee, and then it'll come back down for landing on the drone ship. Second stage partway through its lengthy burn to get the crew into orbit. So, Kate, four and a half minutes in, everything continues to look good. What a absolutely picture-perfect liftoff. We've got a live view of the crew inside Dragon Endeavor. Looks like uh, everyone is still pretty comfy. Uh, as John had said earlier, we got Dragon to... Dragon SpaceX. Trajectory nominal. All right, good call out there um, that trajectory is nominal. Uh, yes, never, we copy. As John mentioned, we got to about three and a half G's there. Position of signal, New Hampshire. On the left-hand side of your screen, we can see the first stage as it is making its way back down to Earth. It's targeting a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, which is parked a couple hundred miles off the coast of Florida out in the Atlantic Ocean. Second stage on the right-hand side, everything continues to be nominal there as the MVAC engine is powering the second stage and Dragon in Denver, Dragon Endeavor to its targeted drop-off orbit. Absolutely beautiful views of both the first and second Dragon stages. SpaceX, trajectory nominal. All right, so coming up in about a minute and a half, uh, the first stage will execute the first of two burns required for today's landing attempt. Um, at about T plus seven minutes and 30 seconds, we'll see the entry burn begin. That's where the first stage will ignite um, the center engine first, and then a couple seconds later, ignite two more engines, so a total of three engine burn. Um, which will last about 29 seconds. The entry burn slows the vehicle down significantly as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. The first stage sees high drag, which scrubs roughly 70% of that velocity by the time that the landing burn begins. Stunning view where you can see the curvature of the Earth there on the left-hand side. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. There you can see the nitrogen gas thrusters. That's the puff of um, gas that you see there occasionally. That's used for uh, attitude control systems. We also utilize those grid fins that you see. There are four of them uh, placed around the booster. Uh, and those grid fins also help steer for a precise landing. Um, either at Stage one entry burn startup. Stage two, All right, there Step we can stage. see that that entry burn has begun. We are targeting a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas today. Everything continuing to look nominal with trajectory and uh, MVAC performance there for our second stage on the right-hand side. So we are conducting the entry burn. Previously, the booster stage was- Stage one, entry burn, shut down. That entry burn helps slow the booster down. It was going about 25 times the speed of sound. So we slow it down as it re-enters the dense part of the Earth's atmosphere. The next event is second engine cutoff, or SECO, 
one as you see it there on the timeline at the bottom of your screen. Stitch two in thermal guidance. That's where we shut down the MVAC engine or second okay, engine cutoff. Copy, Shannon. Stage one transonic. Note that our landing burn and second engine cutoff uh, will occur about the same Impact time. Shut down. All right, we got a live view of the crew inside Dragon Endeavor there on the right hand side of your screen. Stage one landing burn. Landing burn has begun for the first day, Dragon first stage. Six, nominal orbit insertion. All right, great news there. Dragon Endeavor, nominal orbit insertion. SpaceX Endeavor, we copy, and it's great to be here. Zero G, and we feel fine. Stage one landing leg deploy. SpaceX Dragon launch skip system disarmed. As you can see, this Falcon 9 has landed for the fifth time. All the while, great commentary there. Confirmed. While we can confirm the landing. Confirmed landing there of the first stage booster. Also, almost simultaneously, great news uh, for the second stage. We heard that there was nominal orbit insertion uh, for Crew Dragon Endeavor. There you can see a live view inside our Dragon. Looks like the crew is beginning to adjust to zero G. If you look at the right hand side corner, it looks like we can see the zero G indicator. Yeah. That was one of my that, that was one of the things I really wanted to see what they were gonna bring for their zero G indicator. So I can't wait to see what comes on. It looks I can't quite tell. Pokemon. <laughs> uh, maybe okay, well hopefully it'll it'll come into closer view. Yeah, but and if not, we'll get to ask them later, hopefully. Yeah. Great to see the crew here again starting to it really getting their first taste yeah. of microgravity. Yeah. Oh, it has ears. Oh, it's a bunny. It Is that like Thumper? I think it might be. I think that's Thumper from Bambi. <laughs> Love it. So right now, uh, the second stage is basically preparing for uh, dragon separation. Um, we are the next step now that, uh, as we said, dragon has nominal orbital insertion. The second stage and dragon will separate. Views there of our uh, MVAC engine now shut off, no longer glowing that lovely shade of orange. Mm. Right now, the second stage is about 200 kilometers above Earth. Preparing now for stage separation. Or excuse me, for dragon separation. For those of you that have just recently joined us, we had an on-time liftoff of the Axiom-1 crew. They are now in space and uh, are coming up to separation from second stage, at which point um, they will then begin to make their journey, continue their journey uh, to the International Space Station. view that you're currently looking at is inside the Dragon trunk, which as you can see has just separated from the second stage. On behalf of the Falcon 9 team, Thanks, welcome to space. To Thanks for flying Falcon 9. You guys enjoy your trip to that wonderful space station in the sky. Do some great research for us. We'll look to see you back here underground. Now stand by for some words from LD. And MLA and, and uh, the rest of the crew endeavor. Glad we got to have some fun this morning. We'll probably be calling an early weekend over here at the Cape. Pass you over to Anna and the team. You'll be in good hands. Godspeed, Endeavor. Enjoy the rest of your flight. Cheers. Hey, Mark. It was a lot of fun. I venture to guess we had a little bit more than you did. We thank you and your launch team, Gersh, you and the Falcon 19. That was a hell of a ride, and we'll be looking forward to the next 10 days. All right, some nice words there from a couple of key folks.
My first Quindar tone of the yeah, mission. Yeah. <laughs> I queued up right when I heard that. <laughs> there we can. Expected, expected loss of signal, Bermuda and New Hampshire. There we can see uh, Dragon Endeavor on its way to the International Space Station. It has separated. There's a view Dragon inside. Space, we had nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. There we can see over the shoulder of... SpaceX Endeavor, we copy, okay. Over the shoulder, previously, Commander uh, MLA was on the left, and pilot uh, Larry Connor was on the right. Live view inside the cabin. They just got the okay to lift their visors. All right. All right. So we can see that everyone is in space. Yeah. We can see that zero G indicator floating around. Great view there um, of Dragon Endeavor. Now in space with the Axiom One crew yeah. on their way to the International Space Station. Yeah, I mean, this is a day of firsts. You know, this is my first time getting to participate in a launch like this. This is a first for Axiom. I mean, this is a first for spaceflight. And it's just wonderful to see such a picture-perfect picture launch. It really was. We saw, we saw the landing, <laughs> and we saw uh, orbital or uh, uh, zero-G insertion at the same time. I mean, that was perfect. Yeah. It was wonderful to see. All right, well, as I just said, today's launch is one for the history books. So to punctuate this milestone that NASA and commercial companies are able to achieve together, we go now to Kennedy Space Center, where Megan Cruz is with NASA's Kathy Leaders. I am. I'm here right now with the Associate Administrator of NASA's Space Operations Mission Director. It's so great to have you here, Kathy. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the launch? Oh, my gosh. It's, <laughs> it's always like, you know, right in the bottom of my throat. I'm yes. holding. I can't breathe. Can't breathe. Yes. But what a beautiful, beautiful sight. Yeah. So good to see it. I, I want to tell everybody working Artemis 1 wet dress, we're off the range. We're off the range for Axiom 1, and we can get moving. But um, you always want to hear the engine cut off. You always yes. want to hear that second stage engines lighting. You always want to hear, you know, each of these stages, and we need to just keep carefully working through the different steps to get the, that crew there to the International Space Station safely. Yeah. What does Axiom-1 represent? Axiom-1 and also future private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. Hey, you know, NASA's original goal was to enable commercial industry. That was actually in our original Space Act agreement. And so here we are, you know, 60 years later, enabling that through our missions. And so I just feel like this is a culmination of 60 years of work for yes. us. And here we are once again getting to see, and for the first time, the first time getting to have commercial, you know, private astronauts going to the International Space Station, and they'll get to see what our government the, what they're calling professional astronauts yeah. doing their real work, and but then also getting to do their work too. And it's a, it's another place where learning to peacefully work in space, I think is moving us forward. Yeah, so important. And you know, we just watched Axiom 1 lift off from that launch pad right there behind us. In a couple of weeks, we're going to see Crew 4 launch from that same launch pad. And then yeah. just right next to it, pad 39B, we have NASA's brand new space launch system. Can you recall a busier time we've had here at the Space Coast? <laughs> and how is Kennedy Space Center managing its new role as this multi-user spaceport? So I think somebody else, this is, I mean, Bob Cabana had this dream of a multi multi-user spaceport here. So I think he should be very, very proud of his <laughs> KSE team and Janet Petro and her team are obviously leading the way right now because this is not easy to do. It's no, not it's easy not. to go make sure all these people have all the capabilities and are obviously working with our Air Force uh, sister agency there too and making sure that all these launches get supported in a seamless way. Just an amazing job. Yeah, a lot of juggling that has to happen. Yep. So, you know, I just talked about SLS. We are looking forward to the moon with that launch mm -hmm. later this year. You know, why is it still so important to maintain a presence in low Earth orbit when we're looking towards the moon now? Because we still don't have everything figured out how to do things yet for the moon and Mars. 
And really the cheapest place for us to see a differential gravity environment and for the long term is still LEO. Yeah. And so we've got to continue to do these long duration flights, keep doing our medical protocols, keep doing our physical protocols, keep testing out our equipment through those long duration missions. It's the only place where we can do that right now. Yeah. And so we still need to be able to have this kind of a test bed for us to be checking out and proving our protocols, our research, our technology before you go put somebody in a rocket that's going to go to Mars, right? Yeah. So just like always, we prepare, we get ourselves ready, and a low Earth orbit destination is a perfect place to do that. And again, how does us fostering commercialization efforts in space, how does that free us up to pursue these other dreams that we have as an agency? So, you know, the administrator today in, in the um, pre-mission conference, he said, you know, we right now are doing, this is our first step. We're working with a, a commercial company to have them come to our International Space Station. And yep. we're learning to work together and figuring out how to work together. And this is going to be an important step for us because moving forward, we would actually like to now be able to buy a ride and time on orbit yeah. with a commercial company to be able to have them do that. And so this is the first step of their learning from us and us learning from them. And then in the future, you know, we're going to have space station for another eight years, but we would like by the early 2030s for us to be flipping the roles yeah. and have our professional astronauts going up and, and checking and doing and focusing on the research and technology we need for exploration but allowing commercial providers to be doing the hard work of maintaining the laboratory. Kathy, what an exciting future. I'm looking forward to seeing it, and thank you again for being here. Thank you. All right, back to you, Dan. All right, hey, thanks, Megan. It is great to see the AX-1 mission on orbit. The team here uh, with the space station are ready. We're ready to get them on board. So their journey just started. They've got about 20 and a half hours until they're docked to the space station. Again, they're headed for the Zenith port on Node 2. That's the space-facing one on the very top. Uh, with that docking scheduled right now for 11.45 GMT on Saturday. Uh, that is just about... 6.45 a.m. here in Houston, uh, 4.45 a.m. for the teams out on the West Coast. Uh, once they get there, we'll be able to get into all of the hatch open operations, welcome them on board. We expect the hatches to open up about two hours after that docking, maybe a little bit less, uh, and then that welcome ceremony coming not too long after. So. That'll do it for us for today, at least here from Houston. We're going to be joined again tomorrow by uh, the SpaceX and the Axiom team as we walk you through the final stages of the rendezvous. And that coverage is going to be starting at 4.30 a.m. Central, 2.30 a.m., so an early morning, my friends over there on the West Coast. So with that, again, congratulations to the SpaceX and Axiom teams for getting this crew on orbit. We'll be ready for them tomorrow to get them on board the space station. I'll send it back now to the team at Hawthorne and over over to Kate. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, actually, just heard in our ears just now, successful nose, co nose cone opening. All right, so that was basically the last physical step yeah. um, for this morning. Um, so that we're gonna start wrapping it up. Uh, now, over the next 20 hours, Dragon will execute a series of burns to gradually raise and line up the AX-1 crew for docking with the International Space Station in what we refer to as the activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. Now, in just a few minutes, the crew will doff or take off their spacesuits to get a little more comfy for their flight uh, and will enjoy their first meal aboard the spacecraft. At 2 p.m. Pacific, they will get ready for a rest period that will last for about 10 hours, uh, eight hours for actual sleeping and a couple of hours for pre slash post sleep activities. Uh, before they arrive at the space station, we will have two potential opportunities to chat briefly with the crew on orbit. One later this morning around 11.10 a.m. Pacific and one early tomorrow around 12.10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, while we're hopeful one of these will work out, neither opportunity is guaranteed as they're dependent on crew schedule and ground station coverage. Now, if we're able to support, we'll make an announcement on our social media channels no later than 15 minutes before the event start time. 
Uh, in the meantime, be sure to keep tabs on the mission at axiomspace.com, and you can track Dragon's Flight on spacex.com slash launches. Right, and as Kate mentioned, even if we aren't able to talk live with the crew, we will continue to provide updates on the mission across our social media channels. And starting at 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 a.m. Pacific on Saturday, April 9th, we will pick back up with our live joint coverage of the AX-1 crew's approach and docking to station with NASA. So please keep an eye on Axiom and SpaceX social channels for updates, and regardless, we hope to see you back here at 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time for live coverage of the first all-private astronaut mission to the space station. So from all of us at Axiom Space, thank you to SpaceX, and thank you to NASA. This is just the beginning in the next chapter, and thank you at home for tuning in. We hope to see you soon.